Star Killer, written by Savage Tempest. Chapter One: A Decade of Bad Choices. Decades of bad choices. If Cygnus was being honest with himself, which led him to this planet and his present circumstances, the massive Brahmin military hangar would hopefully serve his purpose. However, the New Eden Empire would have been a better choice. Cursory research on Brahma culture showed this particular sect of humans to be rigid and unyielding as the rows of metal spaceships before him. Sadly, Arcadia was the nearest human planet he could portal to, so the Brahmins would have to do. Ignoring his doubts, his fears, Cygnus worked with feverish intensity. His four-fingered hands nimbly navigated the foreign control console in front of him. It wasn't just the fear of capture that haunted him. It was the heavy cloak of guilt for a mission that teetered precariously on the brink of failure. The Nimbus would be here soon, too soon, the filthy murderers. His wife's smiling face absorbed his thoughts for a moment. Canapa and Hesperia too, his precious, precious daughters. He should have remained with his family, died with them. Cygnus wiped away the tears from his eyes with the back of his hand. No time for self-pity. He had a mission to complete and a sentient race to save despite being helpless to save his own. The sudden echo of approaching footsteps snapped Cygnus back to his grim reality. A Brahmin officer, his uniform crisp and authoritative, rounded the corner. His eyes, full of suspicion, barely had time to widen in shock before Cygnus acted. With grace belying his size, Cygnus neutralized the threat, the officer crumpling silently to the ground. No life snuffed out, just a temporary slumber at least until the Nimbus came. Cygnus hid the Brahmin in the shadows and hurried back to the spacecraft controller console. The metallic scent of ionized air filled his nostrils, a constant reminder of the raw power that thrummed through the veins of this massive Brahmin military station. Soon, all too soon, distant screams pierced the stillness of the hangar. The Nimbus were here. He needed to hurry, before it was too late. Two more minutes. Please. Cygnus flipped the lever that would lock down the hangar, sealing him in tight. Not that it would keep the Nimbus out, but it might buy him another couple of precious seconds. Without warning, the air shimmered as a Nimbus warrior phased through the hangar's east wall, its awful fingers dripping with fresh blood. Even in the dim lighting, the Nimbus was quite a fright, its hideous face a blend of primate and bone, and muscled arms nearly the size of tree trunks. Such a race was beneath his people, barely out of caves. And yet in the span of decades, the Nimbus technology far surpassed Cygnus's race. The scientists didn't know who, but they were convinced that some advanced species gave the Nimbus their new technology. You shall not escape, flee. The Nimbus's voice was a mocking snarl, its words slithering through the air like venom. Panic surged through Cygnus as he punched in the last of the codes. A nearby cruiser ship's steps descended with a hiss. He lunged toward salvation only to be frustrated by the cold, unyielding force of the Nimbus now blocking his path. Yes, its upper body was much like a primate's, but its four legs looked and moved like a malicious spider. Cygnus whipped out his pistol and shot the creature with a pulse beam. The shot missed, the Nimbus having already moved sideways. The creature, though several meters shorter than Cygnus, roared with delight as it backhanded Cygnus, sending him tumbling across the cold, unforgiving floor. The Nimbus's claws came next, tearing through Cygnus's belly with brutal precision. Each strike, a blizzard of agony. His agony. Cygnus tried to crawl to the cruiser, every movement streaks of more pain, trying to break his determination. Please. Cygnus gasped, his voice barely a whisper. Time's up, three. The Nimbus sneered, delivering a final crushing blow, its left front leg plowing down through Cygnus's back. Cygnus screamed as his vision fractured into shards of pain and shadow. The Nimbus hovered over him now, scowling down at him. Why do you smile, fool? Cygnus didn't answer. Wouldn't answer even if he could. The Brahmin ship, the desperate scramble to get to it, all a ruse. A distraction to buy the precious seconds needed for his data burst to be broadcast. The message sent, a warning given. His mission against all odds was complete. Maybe the gods will forgive me yet, Cygnus thought, as peace settled over his fading consciousness. Chapter 2 
two against one. Captain Devon Sparks had faced worse odds before, but this time one of those odds was a quantum computer, a sentient quantum computer. No way he would win this fight, but that wasn't going to stop him from trying. He and Kara were having this meeting, argument really, in the chamber he dubbed the captain's operations room. It was attached to the bridge's upper deck and was pretty small, at least compared to the rest of the layout on the Freedom. Locke was in full QI snooty mood. If you dislike Captain Mendez so much, why did you kiss her back on Centauri Station? Devon felt heat rise to his face at the quantum intelligence's accusation. Kara, thanks to her Brahmin conditioning, wasn't openly smirking at him. But thanks to the integration that they now shared with the ship and Locke, he could tell that she was amused by the question. That was a pretend kiss, Locke, and stop spying on me already. A pretend kiss? We only kissed so I could discreetly see the mercs following us. It's not like he enjoyed it, much. Usually the operations room's soothing blue lighting and subtle angles calmed him, when he was alone. I don't trust Mendez. Devin looked at Kara seated at the room's sole table. Why not? The woman was way too calm, too logical, which made her perfect to lead Freedom's engineering frequency. Maybe he should sit down, but he felt too agitated. Having to look at Mendez's fashion model face in the hollow mist wasn't helping. The mist, a synthesis of digital technology and H2O, floated just above the room's circular table. There are a dozen reasons why she's a bad fit. Let's begin with one reason, shall we? Said Locke, sounding like an uppity butler. I'll give you two. She's a smuggler without a ship because Brahmin enforcers took said ship away from her. And now she's eyeing the freedom like it's her salvation. Devon glared at Kara, wishing he could glare at Locke instead. Damn invisible QI. Ambassador Barclay, Chase, and Captain Mendez, said Locke, slipping into patient mentor mode, have proven their worth. Captain Sparks, we need a crew. You know this. Devon's jaw clenched. There's only one captain on board the Freedom Lock, and that's me. Kara's bland expression didn't change, but he could feel echoes of annoyance coming from her. He made a mental note to ask Locke if he could block his thoughts and feelings from Kara. It was unnerving, feeling emotions that weren't his own. Plus, it was tough enough getting used to having Locke inside his head. Hell, Mendez never even said thank you for saving her from death by life pod. Kara stared at Devon. So you'll never forgive her for the slight? Devon shook his head, frustration simmering beneath his skin. It's not about forgiveness. It's about trust. My gut says she's trouble. Locke chuckled, annoying Devon further. Why not try flipping your gold coin, Captain? Perhaps you'll have better luck with that than with flossing daily. Devon scowled at the air. You told me the new acids in my mouth took care of tooth decay. Only when you're in your aspect form, said Locke, a hint of smugness in his voice. Kara wrapped her knuckles on the table to get Devon's attention. And what of the others, Captain? Barclay might prove useful. I suspect our passenger Chase Hale has potential as well. Devon sighed, rubbing the bridge of his nose. Barclay's in, though heaven knows what we'll do with an ambassador. Kara, see if he's interested, will you? You two have a certain rapport. Kara's expression remained neutral, but her voice held a wry tone. I wouldn't call our relationship close. You survived a bunch of mercs and Brahma fighters together. That's close enough. And Chase Hale? Devon studied Kara for several moments before answering, wondering if attraction had anything to do with her advocacy for the man. Probably not. Yeah. Kara looked 20 years younger since integrating with the Freedom, but she still had the personality of a... robot. Devon killed the thought. He was being cruel, and Kara didn't deserve it. Chase is a non-starter. I trust him even less than I do Mendez. Is that because of Mr. Hale's creamy muscles and washboard abs? What? Captain Mendez's words, Locke said. Not mine. When she was alone in her quarters, speaking to herself. Devon and Kara's eyes met. Her concern mirrored his own. Devon addressed the air. Locke, it's considered impolite to eavesdrop on someone when they're in their quarters. Who considers it impolite? Devon fought the urge to plant his face in his hands. 
Just don't do it, please, unless it's a security issue or something. As you wish, Captain Sparks. Why did Devon have the feeling that this decision would come back to bite him? And what? Continued Locke. Shall we do for the rest of the crew? As formidable as the freedom is, Captain Sparks, this starship still needs a crew to function properly. Devon felt his jaw tightening again. What's the minimum amount of people we need to run this ship? Six. Devon nodded, a plan already forming in his mind. All right, get Mendez, Barkley, and Chase to the hangar. We're going on a little trip. Chapter 3 Devon was already regretting his decision. Not his decision to stop at Arcadia. Withdrawing money from a Brahmin bank made sense, especially given the amount of funds Locke pilfered from the Brahmin military. But strolling into a Brahmin establishment could easily mean a one-way ticket to prison. Or worse, still a calculated risk worth taking in his opinion. However, bringing Chase Hale along as muscle, perhaps not his brightest idea. Throughout their trek through Dorado, Arcadia's capital city, Hale had prattled on ceaselessly, touching on every topic under the sun, yet revealing nothing of substance about himself, leaving Devon with more questions than answers. Something was off about the man, and the sooner they dropped him off on a New Eden planet, the better. Maybe he was just jealous. The man was way too tall with rugged good looks, very different to the city and people around them, who moved around like robots. Their eyes glazed with numb intention and symposium. Kudos to Kara for ditching the drug. We there yet? Asked Hale. Devon twisted his hand and glanced at the GPS hollow just below his wrist. Almost? He increased his pace, Hale remaining a respectful three steps behind. At least the man knew how to play bodyguard. Devon tried not to look like a tourist even as he took in the city. The brooding buildings lacked imagination, but not height. It was strange passing giant billboard screens of talking heads, spouting propaganda nonsense instead of advertisements. Forty minutes later, Arcadia's only interplanetary bank, Lamia, loomed before them. The very moment they exited from the bank's grand doors, Devon sensed two sets of eyes on them. Enforcers. Without their swords, they looked almost like priests with their white collars and knee-length black jackets. Experience had taught him that enforcers were anything but priestly. A stern-faced man emerged from an almost invisible door and intercepted Devon and Hale before they made it halfway through the empty space. How may I assist you today? His fake smile said, let's get this over with heathen scum. Devon flashed him a smile anyway. I'd like to make a withdrawal. A big withdrawal. He added, willing down the nervousness in his gut. He still wasn't sure if he would get away with this. The banker's dead blue eyes shifted to Hale. My bodyguard. The banker nodded and escorted them to a half-opened booth. He instructed Devon to insert his arm into the metal device attached to the booth's back wall. The device clicked and whirred. Yellow lights flickered next. Everything okay? Devon ventured, his unease growing as the enforcer standing by an oversized marble column looked in their direction. Ignoring Devon's question, the banker pursed his lips. That's odd. It's not reading your DNA. Devon activated his neural link with Locke. Locke. Need some help here with DNA authorization. Almost instantly, the machine buzzed, its light switching to green. The banker frowned but nodded. Devon dared a quick look over his shoulder at Hale. The man stood as still as a rock, hands clasped around his back and away from any weapons he might be carrying. No threat at all. The enforcers were buying it, for now. Outside, Devon reminded himself not to walk too fast. Act natural. His thoughts gradually drifted to Nolan. Fighting off both New Eden and Brahma proved Nolan wrong. He wasn't a loser like their dad. Maybe it was time to forgive his only brother. Maybe. Especially now with his pocket heavy with credit chips and the scent of freedom strong in the breeze. We're being followed. Jolted from his musings, Devon held back a sigh. Apparently everyone but him could spot a tail. I'm open to suggestions. Devon replied, a tinge of frustration in his voice. This way. Chase guided them into a narrow alleyway. Bad move. Two Brahmin enforcers, swords glinting at their sides, blocked their path. 
A quick look over his shoulder revealed another pair at their backs. The bank's message was clear. Withdrawals were not welcomed. Chase's deep voice was steady, almost casual. What do you want to do? Live. Kara tried smiling at Ambassador Barclay. The gesture felt foreign and artificial on her lips. It didn't suit her, so she let the facade fall away. Thank you for joining me, Ambassador. She said, her voice carrying throughout the echo of the Freedom's expansive bridge. Barclay inclined his head, a gesture of courtesy that carried a gravity only diplomats seemed to master. Always a pleasure, Kara. Since picking up Chase Hale from Centauri Station, Sparks had basically banished all non-crew from the bridge. Kara studied Barclay for a moment. He was a picture of composure. His new black uniform pantsuit was accented with a red sash that fell across his chest, a vibrant splash of color that seemed to underscore his control rather than diminish it. Her red slash, however, wrapped around her hips on top of a black jumpsuit more form-fitting than she would have preferred. I'll get straight to the point, Kara said, wishing Sparks would have spoken to Barkley himself. We would like you to join the Freedom's crew. Barkley blinked twice but held his genial smile in place. Obviously, he hadn't seen this coming. That's quite a generous offer, Barkley said, breaking the silence that had begun to stretch between them. Does Captain Sparks agree to this arrangement? Kara nodded. So much of the ship's power flowed through her, yet she didn't know what to do with her hands. Yes, he does. Barkley nodded, seeing past Kara as his eyes swept the bridge a huge space with two decks and devoid of ports or windows, relying solely on a giant hollow mist projections to reveal the planet Arcadia below. And what exactly, drawled Barclay, would I contribute aboard the Freedom? Diplomacy is hardly in demand on a battleship. The Freedom is more than a battleship, Ambassador. Barclay shook his head, his thin lips still smiling. Even if I were to accept your offer... And that's a big if. What in the heavens would I do aboard the Freedom? I'm pretty much useless here. Locke jumped in, his disembodied voice emanating from everywhere. You would make an excellent ship's counselor, Ambassador. In addition, your background suggests that you would also make a splendid Xeno-archaeologist. Why would you need a Xeno-archaeologist? We intend to explore the galaxy. A thought that came close to exciting Kara. A hint of a frown surfaced across Barclay's thin face, then vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Exploration is a broad term, Kara. And the galaxy is not particularly kind to explorers. Kara leaned slightly forward, the bridge's hollow mist casting a soft glow across her face. Well, we now know that there are aliens out there. Indeed, dangerous aliens. Barclay's posture remained rigid, his dark eyes skeptical. There's also the matter of my commitments to the Ambassador Corps. Locke interjected once again. New Eden's military will surely interrogate you, Ambassador. Good heavens, why? Information about the Freedom and its crew. Surely you must be familiar with at least some of your military's more, shall we say... Aggressive interrogation methods. A shadow passed over Barclay's face. I can handle this, Locke. Kara returned her attention to Barclay. Ambassador New Eden will torture you, not out of malice, for information. Barclay swallowed hard, the first crack in his diplomatic armor. Kara, forgive this second intrusion. Go ahead, Locke. Do you recall the aliens that destroyed Armanth? Of course she did. She didn't know what the aliens looked like but those ships. Those horrible fish-like ships. What about them, Locke? They're back. Chapter 4 A sword ain't a damn knife. It's too long to throw, too heavy, without a shred of accuracy. Except in the hands of an enforcer on Arcadia, apparently. The sword spun through the air like a dart, aimed straight for Devon's heart. Good thing for Devon it wasn't a heart of flesh and blood that faced the oncoming steel. His heart was now encased in gold metal crystal, beating within his aspect form. Devon swatted the sword aside, sending it clanging against the nearby alley wall. Just his luck. 
The sword was only a distraction. The enforcer's partner lunged, blade first. The original assailant wasn't far behind, forcing Devon into a relentless retreat. His alien aspect form might give him the edge in strength and speed, but these were enforcers. They were downright lethal. Worse, they worked as a team. Yeah, they were a little surprised to see him morph into an alien, but they got over it. Quick. Devon wasn't sure how Hale was doing since the enforcers on his side had tossed a smoke grenade before attacking, effectively leaving Hale shooting blind. The shooting, though, had stopped, leaving only a soundtrack of grunts and thuds. One of Devon's attackers had ebony skin, the second polished red hair. No hate in their eyes, though, just fierce determination. The alley was narrow, which didn't give him a lot of room to maneuver, but it worked against the enforcers, too. They couldn't flank him. An overhead strike almost split Devon's head in two. He blocked it just in time. But that gave the other enforcer the chance to land several hard blows to Devon's left side. If he weren't in aspect form, those blows would have landed him on his butt. Devon barely ducked in time, the enforcer's sword coming close enough to give him a shave. No surprise. The enforcer's buddy was right there to take advantage, landing a solid sidekick that sent Devon stumbling back. That one hurt, but the pain quickly subsided. For a moment he wondered how Hale was doing. He wasn't a fan of the guy, but he would hate to see him killed under his watch. A slash to his right arm accompanied by a spasm of pain brought Devon back to what mattered most, surviving this fight. To his supreme disappointment he realized that he was losing. Meaning. It was time to fight dirty, but these damn enforcers were as disciplined as they were skilled. A blade swipe at Devon's legs followed by a high kick sent him sprawling to the cobblestones. Old military training kicked in and Devon rolled, managing to snatch up a fallen sword. He was on his feet in an instant. His new sword didn't do much good. The redhead knew how to use a sword. Devon didn't. Metal clashed. The enforcer kept coming, kept slashing while his partner got in kicks that drove Devon back. The stab just below his right shoulder wasn't surprising. Still hurt, though, and burned, but Devon wasn't giving up, and he certainly wasn't going to give up his 10,000 credits. With a roar that didn't sound quite human even to his ears, Devon seized the red-headed enforcer, using his own forehead as a battering ram against the man's skull. Dazed, the enforcer became the perfect shield as his partner's sword rammed toward Devon's heart skewering his partner, who gasped, then slumped against Devon, who shrugged the dying enforcer off of him. This didn't anger the dark enforcer. No surprise there. Along with controlling Brahmin citizens, Symbosium kept you calm in a fight. Not so for Devon, especially when he was up against a much better fighter. He wasn't tired, but the aches and wounds to his body were starting to slow him down. Luck, or perhaps fate, gave him the opening he needed, the enforcer's attack came fast. A feint to Devon's midsection, the enforcer backhanded his sword at Devon's neck. Devon shifted his shoulders just enough to get his head out of the way. He grabbed the enforcer's wrist and squeezed until he heard bone break. Pissed at his beating, Devon smashed the enforcer in the face with an elbow strike, all while holding onto the enforcer's broken wrist. Despite the blood in his wrist, the enforcer only grimaced. Devon didn't care. He twisted the man's arm until there was a grotesque snap. The enforcer's scream was cut short as Devon jammed the man's own sword into his belly, the blade sinking deep. Devon looked around, panting, bloodstains all over him. He turned around. Thankfully, the smoke had mostly cleared. Two enforcers lay dead near Hale's big feet. Hale slowly turned to face him, wincing at Devon's alien form. You're one ugly alien monster. The man was grinning despite the cuts and bruises now on his face. Devon patted his pocket with the 10,000 credits. Then his other pocket with his lucky gold coin. Both prizes were there. This alien monster is paying you and giving you a ride. Devon started walking. So shut up and let's clear out before backup comes. Jessica had to remind herself that she was angry. She was a space captain, not some damn chauffeur. Yet as her hands caressed the space fighter's sleek wall lining for the umpteenth time, her resolve wavered. Despite its beauty, the Freedom Soul fighter ship's layout was peculiar, a central capsule sitting squarely in the ship's center, flanked by two wings that housed the troop and cargo sections. It was the first thing you saw when you entered the ship. Guess it makes sense in an alien sort of way. 
This pilot seat was so comfy and molded to her body like a winter coat. It was hard not to sigh. There was so much to love about this ship. It was fast. Oh boy, was it fast. With oscillating plasma and laser cannons. Heaven. The only downside was how everybody in the ship could see her as she flew this incredible dream. Mercifully, she could turn the cockpit's glass dome opaque. The dome wasn't just glass, though. It was smart glass. Another alien invention. Helm and navigation controls could be manipulated on the glass itself. Function and beauty as one. Grinning like a fool, Jessica allowed her fingertips to graze the smart glass, which sparked to life at her touch. Holographic helm and navigation displays painted light across her face. If you had FTL, she whispered, I would have flown you to the stars the second Sparks stepped off the ship. Sparks, Mr. Know-it-all captain of the Freedom, he had actually barred her from the bridge, the others too. Well, except for the Brahmin. Kara, no last name. Jessica's thoughts drifted to Chase Hale. Mystery man wrapped in a package of lean muscle and a boy-next-door smile. Not a smuggler or a convict, but still a man who carried a dangerous edge, though wrapped in charm. Jessica knew the type all too well. They were the kind that set her heart racing for all the wrong reasons. Jessica shook her head to brush away stupid distractions. She needed to concentrate on things that mattered. Like how the hell she was going to wrestle the freedom away from Sparks. Yes, this fighter ship was beyond dreamy, but taking over the freedom would set her up for life. Perhaps start a smuggling syndicate of her own instead of simply being a freelancer. She patted the V-throttle in front of her and cooed. Not that I don't love you, baby. Baby? Stupid Sparks didn't even give this ship a name. An absolute crime for such a gorgeous ship. I'm going to call you Valkyrie. Unsurprisingly, Sparks shattered her happiness. His voice boomed through the cockpit smart glass. Mendez. Jessica sighed. Captain, Mendez here. We might be coming in hot, be ready. You got it. She replied, the words automatic, her tone professional. Too professional. Crap. She muttered under her breath. I even sound like a stupid chauffeur. Death rained down from the afternoon sky. Swarms of confused people dashed around Chase, trying to escape the beams of yellow-gold light currently obliterating the city's streets into rubble. Here he was, right in the thick of it all, trying to get to their extraction point. Chase saw plumes of flames in the distance, heard people cut off mid-scream too. That didn't stop him from elbowing and shoving anyone who got in his way. Surviving would be easier if he weren't dragging Sparks along. The man was useless in this mayhem. He considered leaving Sparks to his fate, but doubted Jessica would let him on board the alien fighter ship without the Freedom's captain. Chase tried not to think about Jessica Mendez, especially that cute little body of hers. Lust had no place here, survival first. Everything else came a distant third. Sonic booms seemed to shake the ground as a half-dozen Brahmin fighter ships streaked overhead, then pulled up toward the planet's atmosphere. Finally, Chase muttered. The Brahmins were pulling themselves together and mounting a defense. His hope was short-lived. A massive beam of yellow death sizzled down from the sky, vaporizing the ships in a single blazing sweep. We need to move faster, he growled at Sparks. I'm right behind you. Sparks stumbled. Chase turned and yanked Sparks up. Perhaps Sparks was only superhuman when he was in alien zombie form. Zombie is what Jessica called Sparks, but to Chase, Sparks looked more like a gold statue bathed in small chunks of rose quartz crystal. Given how everyone else was running around like a chicken with its head cut off, Sparks was holding up better than expected. Chase had watched him take down two Brahmin enforcers. He suspected the alien DNA flowing through the man's blood had something to do with it. Those two enforcers should have tore Sparks to shreds. The two that he killed were good. Real good. Unlucky for them. He was better. Much better. He was ready to give Sparks a hand, but was curious to see how long Sparks could last. Chase picked up the pace. Half jog, half speed walk. Dorado City had now descended into full chaos. Brahmin citizens, however, only screamed when death slapped them in the face, their emotions dulled by daily doses of symbosium, Chase guessed. More beams of death sliced through buildings and flesh, indiscriminate in their destruction. Chase pushed on. 
suspecting that similar scenes were unfolding planet-wide. The spaceports, even if they could get to one, would be jammed packed right now. No Jessica and the alien fighter ship was his only way off Arcadia right now. He hadn't planned on giving Sparks and his gang of misfits his real name. The alien ship's damn QI had snatched that information from his comms implant the minute he stepped onto the Freedom, which should have been impossible to do. What else did Sparks' so-called quantum intelligence know about him? Hopefully not that he was a New Eden spy sent to steal the Freedom, an alien ship, which made Chase wonder again, who the hell was planet-bombing Arcadia? Definitely wasn't New Eden. So who? Which could be figured out later, right now. He was running for his life while the world burned around him. Chapter 5 Nightmare That word gripped Devon's mind as chaos reigned on the packed streets of Dorado. The sickening stench of smoke and burning flesh clogged the air, a morbid fog that clung to him as he stumbled through the city's demise. Beams of death continued to pound the city from above, each blast a burning hammer, sealing the fates of those too slow or too shocked to move. Devon did his best to tune out the cries and screams and keep his eyes focused on Hale's back instead of looking around at people he couldn't help. He tripped again, looking up just in time to see a huge chunk of a tower crashing down toward them. Hale barreled into him, sending them both sprawling several meters away. The fall hurt like hell, and Devon could barely move. Get off me. You're welcome, Hale said, rising first. Devon knew he should be grateful, especially when he looked at where they were seconds ago and saw several body parts sticking out from the fallen piece of tower. Crushed. Devon got to his feet and brushed at the dirt and grime on his jacket. Please help. Someone. Without thinking, Devon moved toward the voice. Hale grabbed him roughly by the arm. Devon pulled away, ready to hit the guy. There's no time, Sparks. They're dead anyway. Devon paid Hale no mind and rushed over to a thin man struggling to lift the piece of stone that should have killed them both. Give me some room. Confused, the man stood up. His face went white with alarm the second Devon turned into his alien aspect. I know that I look bad, but I'm here to help. Shaking his head and too stunned to speak, the man took a step back, then turned and ran. Ignoring the wimp, Devon widened his stance and started lifting. Jeez, this thing was heavy. Hale, give me a hand. Sighing loud enough to be heard a block away, Hale joined him. This is crazy. Devon didn't care what the man thought, as long as they got this hunk of stone off whoever was under there. His aspect form gave him superhuman strength, but the stone was damn heavy and at a weird angle. In a few seconds, though, they were able to flip the debris off of a woman who wasn't moving. Her skull and the rest of her crushed. Devon's spirit sank. Ready. Devon just looked at Hale. Ready for what? Watch more people die. He followed Hale back to the middle of the street. Chaos had now descended fully in the streets. Ironically enough, the Brahmins only screamed when they were hit or crushed, no doubt thanks to the symposium neutering their emotions. More beams of yellow death cut through the city's skyline. A two-passenger ship careened into the side of a building, not a hundred meters in front of them. Hale pulled them both against a nearby building's facade. Shards of glass rained down on them from the force of the collision. Devon spread his arms in the air, using his body to protect Hale. The glass shower over, Hale looked down at him and placed a hand on Devon's chest, moving him back. You're not my type. Good. Devon turned away from Mr. Funny Man and placed his left wrist near his lips. Mendez, we're having trouble reaching Xville. Can you track our signal and meet us? I'm already here, came the terse reply directly into the comm implant in Devon's head. The Freedom's fighter ship shimmered into view, uncloaking like a specter against the backdrop of devastation. The angular fighter rested in the street. It was thirty meters of smooth cobalt metal etched with crimson accents stretching back to its triple thruster array. Devon pushed forward, propelled by a single-minded purpose. Survive. A disheveled family stood by the ship, statues in the storm, their eyes wide with quiet fear at the sight of his fighter ship. Its door slid open and into the ship's roof. Mendez was front and center, tucked in the pilot's capsule. Shifting back into human form, Devon ran over to the family. Come with us, please. 
The father shook his head, his knuckles whitening on his wife and child's shoulders. Maybe they saw him transform. They're not going to trust an alien. Hale shouted, his eyes tracking the sky for more incoming death. Devon cursed under his breath as the family scattered, fleeing from one uncertain fate towards another. He did his best to banish the image of the bewildered little girl from his mind and made for the ship, the door sliding shut behind him when a desperate voice pierced the roar of destruction. Wait! Devon sent a mental command to the ship's door to slide open again. Running toward them, if you could call it running, was a middle-aged man dressed in clothes that clearly marked him as non-Brahmin. Take me, please. The man had a notable limp. Devon was no hero, but how can you not feel for the guy? He started for the door when Hale's heavy hand on his chest halted him. I'm better at this, Hale said, and with the grace of a predator, he was off. Devon watched as Hale scooped up the stranger into a fireman's carry and sprinted back to the ship. He was back inside in seconds, the door sealing with a hiss. Get us out of here, Mendez. Devon barked, strapping himself in as the ship's engines thrummed to life. My pleasure. Mendez said, the ship lifting off just as another beam scorched the earth where they had stood moments before. Within minutes, they were rocketing into space. The moment they hit Arcadia's exosphere, Devon's mouth dropped open. A sea of alien spaceships surrounded the planet, some narrow like fish, others wider, more crustacean-like, all of them silver with jagged edges ready to rip through ship hulls, hundreds of them, thousands maybe. And still Devon found it hard to believe. A total invasion against humanity had begun. A suicide run wasn't what she had in mind when she agreed to this. Yet as Jessica's fingers tapped at the smart glass in front of her, a sense of surreal calm enveloped her. This ship, her ship, with its sleek lines and dreamy responsive helm, was made for daring escapes. She darkened the pilot dome, blocking out micromanaging sparks hail and the new guy. A soft glow of amber-tinted holographic displays welcomed her, along with navigational data streaming before her eyes, courtesy of the dome around the cockpit. Get us back to the freedom, Sparks barked over the speaker, preferably in one piece. Don't worry, Sparks, me and Valkyrie got this. Valkyrie? Asked Hale, his voice smoky and annoyingly deep and sexy. She would rather sleep with a loser like Sparks than get tangled with a guy like Chase Hale. The ship needed a name, Jessica said while engaging stealth mode. The ship responded, shrouding itself in the dark embrace of deep space. Thought the captain was supposed to name his ships. Was that humor in Spark's voice? She might have a heart attack if she weren't so busy trying to sneak past these aliens intent on blowing the planet up. I am a captain, Jessica said. Now hold tight. Without missing a beat, Jessica executed a maneuver that felt like rolling thunder the Valkyrie cutting a swift arc through space that left even the stars in awe. She made the mistake of glancing at the ship's aft hollow display. Arcadia. Yellow bright explosions overtaking its surface, its beauty being ripped apart by the relentless fury of energy beams coming from multiple ships. All those people dying. Genocide. That cold hard fact sent a tremor through her, but she quashed it. She had one job. Get them back to the freedom. In one piece. Jessica swiped her hand left across the smart glass in front of her. What lay ahead of them appeared in startling high resolution. An ocean of alien ships. Huge ships, the size of dreadnoughts. They were doomed. No. You can do this, Jessica. You are music and space is your playground. Your friend, said the new guy, does realize we can hear her, right? You okay, darling? Asked Hale. Don't call me darling, Jessica said the fire in her words belying the icy fear that clawed at her heart. The freedom was out there, somewhere beyond the swarm of alien ships hiding in the shadows just as Valkyrie was. But as Jessica guided them closer, the dread that had been gnawing at her became a reality. One of the alien ships, its wings like the jaws of a celestial leviathan and silent as a tomb, drifted too close for comfort. Jessica's breath caught, and for a heart-stopping moment, she thought they'd been spotted. With a deft flick of her wrist, Valkyrie pirouetted through space, an evasion that should have been impossible for a ship her size. Now the freedom was in sight. We're clear, Jessica thought. Just a few more. The alarms blared, 
The rear hollow displays showed a squad of alien ships on their tail. Impossible. They couldn't be seen. The Leviathan she just passed was now pursuing them, too. Freedom, this is Valkyrie. Are you changing your name, Captain Mendez? Ignoring the QI's stupid question, Jessica shoved the throttle forward. Open those damn hangar doors, we're coming in hot. She barked into the comms, her voice steady despite the adrenaline surging through her veins. Instead, she got a series of silent flashes of light pummeling her ship. Valkyrie shook violently. These bastards were scorching her ship. Her beautiful ship. Yeah, technically this was Spark's ship, but since she was the one flying it, Valkyrie was hers. Spiritually, at least. Her control panel sparked, and Jessica fought to keep her grip on the yoke. They were spinning, tumbling through space, but the Freedom's hangar bay was opening. Slowly. Another hit and the world whited out. When her vision returned, Jessica saw it. The Freedom's hangar doors were now closing. What the hell? The Freedom, said Sparks, can't risk the alien death rays blasting into the hangar. Sparks was mad and had a death wish, but she didn't. Jessica swiped at the helm controls, coaxing, demanding, begging Valkyrie to respond. The gap was narrowing, the edges of the hangar doors becoming a merciless vice. Jessica's throat felt tight, her decision made. It was a gamble, a sliver of a chance, but it was all they had. And if anyone could do this, it was her. And Valkyrie. More energy blasts sailed past them, but some connected. Valkyrie, wounded and wailing, hurtled towards the diminishing hangar door space, a wounded beast lunging for the safety of its den. Jessica's world narrowed to the countdown in her head, the space between the hangar doors and the unyielding walls that beckoned. What is she doing? Mendez, warned Sparks. Jessica paid Sparks and the new guy no mind and held her breath, her instincts screaming. She was close. So close. Jessica gave the ship full throttle and dived toward the sliver of an entrance. They weren't going to make it. Not without losing some parts first. Yeah. She thought to herself. Guess I wanted a suicide run after all. Chase opened his eyes to a blazing headache and the disorienting sight of the ship tilted sideways. Had he blacked out? Instinctively, his gaze swept the Valkyrie, taking in the ship's skewed angle. His feet dangled above the floor, his body ensnared in the passenger chair that had morphed into a protective cocoon moments before their crash landing. The foamy cocoon had shielded him from the worst of the impact, saving him from more than just a pounding head. Everyone all right? asked Sparks. Worst landing ever, groaned the stranger they'd just rescued, suspended upside down like a bat. Chase's eyes narrowed on him. Weak. An easy mark. The man would not complicate his plans. Chase's eyes shot back to Sparks and offered the rogue captain a stupid grin. Sparks snapped his fingers, and the chair released Chase, unceremoniously dropping him. Chase landed in a crouch, bending his legs to absorb the impact. Sparks was watching him. He did that on purpose. To test him. Yep. Sparks definitely has to go. Mendez? Sparks called out, wrapping his knuckles against the opaque pilot capsule. You okay? The capsule's dome vanished and Jessica's distraught face appeared. I killed my baby. She wailed, not even looking at Sparks. A good thing, since it was obvious she felt uncomfortable around his zombie form. The ship can be repaired, right, Locke? Sparks' voice was calm, almost soothing. Correct, Captain Sparks, the QI said. I'll even upgrade it. Chase could see the glimmer of hope in Jessica's eyes as she brushed away tears. Really? The dangling stranger ever the nuisance piped up. Will someone get me down from here? Gently? Sparks gave Jessica a friendly pat on the shoulder, then strolled over to the stranger, who dropped into his arms as his cocoon unraveled, all without pressing buttons. Sparks caught him effortlessly. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was out, lasers too since they bounced off him he'd need to be more inventive to kill this guy chase offered jessica a hand as she stepped gingerly out of the capsule to his surprise she took it it's going to be a shame killing her but orders are orders he turned around to see sparks hitting the ship's exit panel lock yes captain sparks the door won't open manually and it's not responding to my mental commands 
Chase's attention perked up. Mental commands? That confirmed that Sparks was plugged into some kind of neural net. No wonder why Wellington wanted this ship. With tech like this, New Eden would be the dominant player in the galaxy. My apologies, Captain. I have detected a potential biological hazard. It was hard to tell when Sparks was in alien monster form, but Chase guessed he was pissed. Open the door lock, we're in the middle of a war zone. The QI didn't answer for a good forty seconds. How strange. I no longer detect the anomaly. Apparently, I was mistaken. A quantum computer making a mistake? That thought should comfort him, but it did quite the opposite. Biological hazard. Chase found his gaze drifting toward the stranger. What's your name, man? The stranger blinked, confusion clouding his features. I don't remember. Chapter 6 Coda Aleph derived no pleasure from Arcadia's vaporized cities or the annihilation of the poor creatures inhabiting the planet. He would, however, enjoy what would happen next. Zadok Geimel and Thane Dalet stood beside him inside the roofless columns of Freydal, Ishtar's most sacred temple while the fickle nebula watched from above. Zadok was wearing his molten lava guise. His massive rock muscles were hideous to look at, but at least the Ishtar had enough taste to forego adding a mouth. Thane, a smidgen smarter than Zadok perhaps, opted for demon wings and a canine face, minus the dog collar. Pity. Before them crackled a golden sphere of energy, which allowed Coda and his fellow Ishtar lords to watch Arcadia burn. Shall we begin? Coda clapped his clawed hands, inwardly smiling at the malevolent beauty of his black scales and their prism-like effect. Thane and Zadok said nothing and pretended to remain focused on doomed Arcadia. Coda thrashed his tail at the seer sphere, disintegrating the golden circle. Good. Now he had his fellow lord's full attention. For this latest challenge, he had taken the form of a dragon-serpent hybrid, one of the Nimbus's highest fake gods. The pulsing red eyes were, of course, his idea. Look up, Baeth. Come forth, said Coda Aleph, inwardly smiling. A large silhouette faded in where the seer sphere once floated. Gradually, Luca Baith appeared in all her reptilian glory. Her four legs were naturally broken, a small promise of what was to come. To Coda's disappointment, Luca's eyes blazed with defiance. Coda inhaled the sight of their fellow lord, Luca Baith, once proud and now humbled. Like dozens before her, Luca had challenged his leadership and failed. Now, she would pay with her life. I didn't expect begging. Coda mused aloud, the corners of his massive maw curling every so slightly upwards in amusement. But a smile? For my victory? Luca shook the sickly green thing that passed for her head. I smile at your hubris, Coda. And I spit from yours. Coda whipped his tail so fast that even Zadok and Thane flinched. Luca took the full brunt of the blow without complaint. Half her side gutted, intestines and blood streamed out. Your porn has failed its mission, Luca. Arcadia and the last of Saiyan's warning are no more. In a burst of power, Coda grew his dragon form, expanding it tenfold as he swallowed Luca whole. After wiping his long snout with the back of his hand, Coda turned to Zadok and Thane. You still wish to challenge me? This is all right. Zadok responded a little too quickly. Despite your cowardly attack on Arcadia, the Brahmins will wipe the Nimbus from the galaxy. Coda snorted at the Lord's bravado, then shifted his sneer to Thane. Since you have only just to be placed on esteemed Lord Luca Baeth, you get to set out this competition. Thane shrugged his cobalt gray shoulders. Where's the fun in that? This was going even better than he had planned. You know the rules, said Coda. Lose the war, you die. Worry not for my sake, Dreadlord. I have found some new pawns to play with. This assertion piqued Coda's interest. Your players have to be New Eden, who are as pathetic as the Brahmins, and certainly no match for my Nimbus. They are New Eden, mostly. Thane folded his arms over his chest. Plus, 
they have a really fast ship. And a very smart computer. Won't be enough to save you. Sadok said his words laced with contempt and confidence. It'll have to be. Thane looked back to Coda Aleph. Are we done? Coda glared at the upstart and watched him and Zadok fade away. He could think of only one reason why Thane would take on such a lost cause as the humans. He means to cheat. Fine. It won't be enough. Freedom. Even after escaping from the Brotherhood's clutches in the symposium that dulled her mind, Kara continually found herself fighting for freedom. First the Enforcers and now this. Aliens. A species so foreign that even Locke hadn't heard of them. Kara allowed her eyes to drift across the expanse of the Freedom's Bridge. As much as she enjoyed exploring the engineering section, the bridge's aesthetics, despite its alien influence, was breathtaking especially from the vantage point of the captain's chair which she currently occupied. Gold and teal consoles and workstations gleaming with smooth curves and minimalistic designs. And as the battleship's engineering frequency, she was connected to it all. The hollow mist was off since there's not much to see when you're in slipspace, and Kara was alone on the bridge since Sparks had forbidden anyone but the two of them to be there without his express permission. Lock? Yes, Kara. The quantum intelligence's response was immediate, his voice sounding more human each day. Is there any way the alien invaders can follow us into slipspace? Unknown. The invaders bypassed Art Gate technology when arriving in Arcadia's system. This indicates that, like the Freedom, the invaders possess advanced FTL capabilities. Kara's fingers paused on the tablet laying on her lap, highlighting lines of her research. What kind of weapons do you believe they used against Arcadia? My analysis suggests a particle disruptor. The invaders' beams unleashed a storm of subatomic particles that quietly dismantled their target's atomic cohesion, thus turning solid matter into dust. Including all life. And here she thought Chen and his fellow enforcers were bad. What chance did humanity stand against such a powerful force? Even the formidable freedom had been driven to flee from the overwhelming onslaught. Humanity, with its squabbles and petty power plays, may have well been rendered moot. Kara mentally summoned the status of Captain Sparks and the others. The information now overlaying her vision told her that they had finished a second decontamination. Interesting. Usually one decon sufficed. A purple marker showed Chase Hale eating in Galley 2 while Mendez showered in her quarters. Ambassador Barclay was exploring the ship. No surprise there. And the man Sparks rescued from Arcadia, still in the medbay. How is our guest in the medbay, Locke? Thomas McRae is recovering nicely. I've repaired the two fractures in his right leg and placed three cell patches on his damaged heart. His memory, however, remains fractured, not uncommon for your species when dealing with severe trauma. Trauma, though accurate, was an understatement. McRae witnessed an act of genocide, and McRae's heart attack was troubling. Ooh, now this is interesting. What, Locke? McRae is attempting to access the ship's schematics database. However, I suspect that is merely a diversion as he digs for greater access to the ship's systems. A hacker? Quite a good one. Shall I continue playing with him, or shall I boot him out now? Have your fun, Locke. Please don't let him see too much, though. Of course. She would have to keep an eye on McRae, but for now, Locke was handling him. Kara picked up where she left off, sifting through the data by blinking, pinpointing Spark's location. She shrank from the strong emotions emanating from him. Perhaps he was upset due to the fighter ship's current condition. Captain Sparks appears to be quite perturbed. She waited, knowing that Locke wouldn't be able to resist offering his opinion. I suspect that the captain's mental state has something to do with what transpired on Arcadia. Are you going to talk to him? Locke was manipulating her. More concerning, the QI didn't feel the need to hide his machinations from her. Resisting the urge to sigh, Kara stood. She still felt embarrassingly awkward interacting with non-Brahmins with the possible exception of Barclay, whose job, after all, was to make people feel comfortable. Anyway. 
They all needed Sparks at his best so she would do what she could. Kara marched down the ramp towards the bridge's circular door. You have the con lock? Naturally, said Locke, the smugness in his voice clear. Shaking her head, Kara almost smiled, which would be a very non-Brahmin thing to do. Just because she had her freedom didn't mean that she should act like a grinning idiot. Unless she wanted to. Chapter 7 Enforcer Chen screamed. He knew the flames lapping at his feet weren't real, but his body refused to believe. So he screamed again as his flesh burned, the fires climbing up his legs, shearing off his skin and flesh, burnt at the stake. If it weren't for the blinding agony, he would readily admit that he deserved this re-education for failing to capture Spark's alien spaceship, not just once but twice. Chen felt his rope around his wrists burn. He snapped them, trying to ignore the fact that his hands were now on fire. Frantic, he slapped at the fire, searing his blackening thighs. Chen wailed in pain as tears poured down his eyes, but he wouldn't beg. He couldn't keep from screaming, but he wouldn't give the council the satisfaction of hearing him plead for mercy. As fire and smoke engulfed him, Chen clawed at his face, tearing away the black headset that had been his gateway into hell. Gasping for air, still hysterical. Chen swatted at the invisible flames no longer licking his body. Minutes later, hours, he wasn't really certain when his mind caught up with reality. He finally took in the sight of the fallen virtual reality headset. Re-education, no. This was torture plain and simple. The virtual inferno of being burned at the stake would be forever seared into his psyche. Chen couldn't stop shaking, couldn't look up from the white floor where he sat splayed. He knew that he was on the Pegasus, knew that execution would be the next phase of his re-education. You've lasted twice as long as you kind. A voice rumbled, cold and mocking. Whipping his head up, Chen recoiled. A nightmarish creature of molten fury, an unyielding stone towered only meters away. Chen's breath hitched, his eyes tracing the thing's monstrous form. Its rock-like surface cracked with veins of glowing lava. The creature's eyes, pits of smoldering rage, fixed on him, mouthless yet somehow able to speak. He had to warn his men. Computer! Alert! An iron grip closed around his throat, hoisting him into the air. The creature pulled him close, scrutinizing him as one might inspect an insect. Just as suddenly, Chen found himself flung across the room. His body slammed into the wall with a dull crunch. The creature's chuckle was the sound of grinding boulders. Real pain is so much better than virtual pain. Don't you agree? Chen's mind raced, desperation clawing at his thoughts. He had to warn the council. His gaze shot to the cipher stone near the back of the room. If he could reach it... Don't bother. The Brotherhood knows of me, and they will comply. As will you. The thing declared, its eyes the color of red plasma. Who are you? Chen spat defiance fueling his voice despite the dread that clutched his heart. The creature, his head nearly reaching the ceiling, seemed to regard him before answering. To your kind, I am a god. I am of the Ishtar. You shall address me as Lord Zedek Gimil, or Lord. I'll do no such thing. With a surge of reckless courage, Chen dove for the discarded headset, grabbed it, and hurled it at Zadok. The virtual headset struck the creature in the face. Nothing. The creature didn't even blink. Chen bolted for the door only to find Zadok materializing before him with a predatory swiftness. Zadok backhanded him, sending Chen flying across the room. His landing was painful. His mouth bloody. I'll never serve you. Chen growled. Zadok's form shifted, becoming Guardian Taggart, Chen's revered mentor. Of course you will. Fumbling, Chen extracted the symbosium injector from his pants pocket. His fingers trembled as he loaded a cartridge. Zadok shook his large head. I'd abstain from symbosium if I were you. Clouds the mind and makes you easy to manipulate. What do you want from me? Chen whispered. I require a Brahmin with a brain. Zadok reverted to his original form. The fact that you're sadistic makes it even better. Chen balked at being called sadistic but held his tongue. The fact that Zadok called him human was infinitely more troubling. Zadok tossed Chen's shirt at him. Get dressed. We have a war to win. 
Kara tried to bury her nervousness as she pressed the chime to Sparks' quarters. Sparks would pick up on her anxiety. He could shield his emotions from her despite their integration with the ship. However, she could not cloak her emotions from him, something she would have to ask Locke about. Later, the metal door bisected and Kara walked in. She immediately recognized the Arcadian solar system spinning inside the hollow mist. Sparks sat slumped on a sofa that looked more like a torture device than a piece of furniture, his eyes fixed on the hollow mist. Red dots blinked like distant alarms, undoubtedly marking the alien invaders' ships. I couldn't save them, Sparks said, his voice hollow. Not Arcadia, not even one family. His eyes met hers, the depth of failure etched into his face. Instead, I ran. Guilt was an alien concept to Kara, but she recognized its shadows across Sparks' face. She'd never pegged Devon Sparks for the type. The gentle musical notes playing in the background reminded Kara that she really didn't know Sparks very well. Only weeks since they first met, after all. Do you wish me to absolve you from the matter? Devon stared at her, dumbfounded, a mixture of anger and confusion in his bloodshot eyes. Brahmins, Kara said more gently this time are conditioned to observe only three authorities. The Brotherhood, one's direct superiors and enforcers. Outsiders are to be distrusted and frowned upon. Symbosium, as you know, keeps us content and any rebellious instincts neutered. But not you. Sparks' stare unsettled Kara, but she naturally didn't show it. He rose suddenly and came toward her. You don't understand, Kara. I could have saved that family, but they didn't trust me. They saw what I am. Kara shook her head. No, Captain, you could not have saved them, but you can help save humanity. Head down, Sparks turned away. Captain, Kara. Locke's voice came from everywhere and nowhere. Your presence is required on the bridge. Sparks grunted. We're not under attack, are we? At the moment, no. Seconds after Devon and Kara arrived on the bridge, the door whooshed open a second time, allowing their uninvited guests to flood in. Mendez led the pack with a swagger, her confidence unhindered by Devon's scowl. Devon shot a message to Locke only he and Kara could hear via his new and improved comm implant. What the hell, Locke? None of these people should be here without my okay. Locke's response was audible for everyone to hear, laced with his familiar smugness. What I have to share affects all of you, and it's best that I show you. At least someone has some manners. Mendez winked at Barclay. McRae flashed a surprisingly white smile at Sparks. I could reprogram a more obsequious personality into your AI if you'd like, Captain. I am not an AI. Oh no, here we go. I am a QI, quantum intelligence. My full name is... Lock Romy Na, said Mendez, folding her arms over her chest. Yeah, we know. Can we get on with this already? Hale leaned over toward her. You got a hot date or something? Mendez kept her eyes on Devon. Not with anyone on this ship. Her body language said, screw you. Her words said. She had given sleeping with him some thought. Devon immediately cut off that dangerous train of thought and turned his attention to McRae. Thought you said you lost your memory? McRae's face reddened. I have, but I do remember that my name is Tom McRae. At least, I think it is. Anyway, I do remember that I'm a computer programmer. A good one. Barclay patted him on the back. And we'd love to hear all about. Later. Locke, we're all ears. Thank you, Ambassador. The hollow mist activated, causing McRae to whistle. Is this a... Shut it, warned Hale. McRae turned a brighter red but shut his mouth, which Devon was grateful for. Continue, Locke. Thank you, Captain. An intricate array of geometric shapes and neon blue lines appeared against the backdrop of slipspace, pulsating as if breathing. While orbiting Arcadia, I discovered an odd data burst. Devon watched the hollow mist, fascinated. The explosion of blue designs and shapes made it look like he was looking at the core of some celestial clock. It's beautiful, said Barclay. And strange. McRae raised his hands and surrendered a hail. Well, it is. Data bursts aren't supposed to look like that. 
Exactly, Thomas McRae, exactly. The encryption was unique, alien. Devon didn't like where this was going. He scanned the faces surrounding the hollow mist. Hale was dutifully not looking his way, but Devon still had the feeling that the drifter didn't miss much. It didn't surprise him when Hale spoke up. You're saying you intercepted the alien invaders' communications? Not at all, Chase Hale. This message was not from the invaders. It came from the planet itself. Devon felt a knot form in his stomach. You're suggesting there's another player in this mess? He asked, the words barely leaving his lips before Mendez cut in. Are we talking about a message from Arcadia's people? A distress call? No, Kara said. Locke stated the data burst is alien in origin. Correct. Locke was in full snooty mode now. A different alien species, different from the invaders who destroyed Arcadia. Observe. The hollow mist swirled and coalesced into a form that was alien, yet hauntingly beautiful. It was male and built overly muscled like hail, taller and sculpted as if from a blue sky. His voice reminded Devon of brass instruments. Translation. Sensing everyone staring at him, McRae added. Please, Locke. My pleasure. I am sickness, said the alien with lips similar to humans. I am also the last Asayan. The sky blue alien paused as if upset. Devon couldn't be sure. Cygnus had no pupils, just luminescent white eyes. My people, continued Cygnus, were destroyed by the Nimbus, a primitive and bloodthirsty species. Devon felt his back stiffen and his cortisol levels jump through the roof. Not because the Nimbus specimen suddenly before them was ugly. Despite the alien DNA in his veins, instinct was instinct. And his instincts said the Nimbus were predators. The upper half of the beast resembled an ape. Dark brown bones armored its massive chest and biceps four times as large as Hale's, which was saying something. Scarier, still. Its bottom half had four spider-like things for legs. Oh my, whispered Barclay. In the corner of his eye, Devon could tell that even Hale looked concerned, no doubt wondering what it would take to kill a creature like that. Devon was wondering the same thing, too. The Nimbus, said Cygnus, have barely graduated from caves, yet here they are, about to destroy one of your colonies. The Nimbus beast morphed into a live feed of Arcadia, pre-invasion. Devon willed himself to relax as he watched the Nimbus ships draw closer to Arcadia. Thousands of them. Their ships were like towering monoliths, impossibly thin and stretching upwards towards the void, as they silently sliced their way through space. Toward Arcadia. Cygnus spoke over the live image that had happened hours ago. Our scientists postulate that some unknown, advanced race gave cutting-edge technology to the Nimbus, including the power of cross-dimensional teleportation. I am including all we know about the members and the state of birth, in the hopes that you and your fellow humans will share the fate of my race, the Isaians. I wish you success. Devon continued staring even as the hollow mist disappeared. He wasn't the only one. Mendez voiced the question on everyone's mind. What do we do now? Now everyone was looking at him. Damn, this was exactly what he didn't want to be responsible for other people, especially for them dying when he made the wrong decision. Captain Sparks, Barclay prompted, not unkindly. We get this information to New Eden and Brahma. My people might think it's a New Eden trick, warned Kara. Especially with the freedom as the bearer of bad news. Barclay nodded. I fear New Eden might feel the same. Devon knew they were right. We'd do it anyway. Then scram. This isn't our fight. This was the first time he saw Hale angry. You heard the man. Hale pointed his finger at where the hollow mist had been. Or whatever the hell that thing was. The Nimbus are coming for all of us. Devon half expected Hale to get up in his face. You're a guest on the ship, Hale. You don't get a say in the matter. Devon shot a glare at Mendez, daring her to say something. For once, she didn't. Without another word, Devon turned on his heel and ascended to the second level, seeing freedom, that fickle mistress, 
slipping through his fingers just when he was getting used to not being under anyone's thumb. Before he reached the captain's operations room, he heard Locke say, The Asians must have been a clever people. It took me hours to decrypt Cygnus's data burst. Locke sounded pleased. Yeah, Mikurei added. But not clever enough to not get whacked. Chapter 8 Koda watched the Nimbus current lead warrior bow down to his altar, not from the black slab of stone sculpted to resemble a serpent with the head of a dragon. No. Koda observed his current tool from Ishtar space, another dimension in which he alone ruled, and would continue to rule once the humans were eradicated. Omari Koda Alif, said Morden, his garish voice an assault to the ears. I seek your wisdom. The insect didn't seek wisdom. Morden only sought permission to kill and slaughter. Wiping out the Brahmin colony and the new Eden planet wasn't enough to satiate the Nimbus leader's bloodlust. Still, it was wise to have the Nimbus carry his altar on their flagship. It would keep him front and center in the minds of his adoring followers. Well, not adoring. The small-minded Nimbus adored nothing but the next kill. Speak. Morden lowered his furred arms and rose to his full height. His neck was warrior thick and his body, a nightmarish fusion of arachnid and beast. We have done as you commanded, Great One. The planet known as Arcadia is no more. Coda expected no less. With over a thousand warships behind him, even a simpleton like Morden could hardly fail. I am aware of your victory, Morden. Corda's voice echoed throughout the dimly lit chamber. Now tell me why you have disturbed my sanctuary. A hint of resentment flashed across Morden's primate face, but he was smart enough not to voice his displeasure. My people, we yearn not for political gamemanship, he rumbled. The Nimbus crave the visceral thrill of combat, the spilling of blood, the taste of flesh. Is the obliteration of two enemy worlds not enough for you? Morden dipped his head in respect. It is the hunt we long for. The final gasp of our prey. And to gorge on their flesh? That too, my lord. Coda's eyes narrowed as he balled his clawed hand into a fist. Almost instantly, a black tendril of darkness shot out of the statue's frozen mouth and wrapped around Morden's thick neck, blocking off all attempts at breathing. Morden clawed frantically at the noose squeezing his throat, yet despite his great strength, he couldn't break free. Insolent whelp. I have given you technology beyond your wildest dreams and have thrown a superior race underneath your feet. And you dare question my methods. The tendril vanished, leaving Morden gasping but not stopping him from spitting out. Humans are not superior to us. Coda allowed his voice to come from everywhere in the chamber. I was referring to these Saiyans. But since you bring it up, the Humes too. Morden bowed deep. Forgive, great Koda Alif. I do not question. I serve. Then hear me well, Morden. Koda said, his tone laced with a deadly promise. I shall go at you, the hunt, the Nibus craves. Six humans and their vessel. They are your quarry. Kill them all. Feed on them if you must. But bring the vessel to me. Coda clarified, knowing the depths of Morden's slow wit. To this Nimbus warship. The ship didn't look human-made, but since Thane was interested in the vessel, it would be better to remove it from the playing board. Morden dared lift his head up to Coda's lifeless statue. It will be done, my lord. See that it is, Morden. Coda Aleph removed his consciousness from the Nimbus flagship and settled back on his cozy perch. Zadok, Gimel, and his Brahmin pawns were no great threat. Thane's New Eden shouldn't be one either. But Thane was up to something. Something involving a small group of humans and a rogue spaceship. He would take great pleasure in snuffing them all out. One by one. The second to last sound Devon ever wanted to hear woke him up from a good sleep. The staccato buzzing of an alarm clock. With a groan. Devon struggled to shut the damn thing off. His hand touched empty air, because he didn't have a stupid alarm clock. Locke? Yes, Captain Sparks? 
Locke sounded disgustingly pleasant. Shut that damn alarm off. The alarm cut off mid-scream. Devin closed his eyes, willing sleep to come back. He was having a lovely dream, one where... The chamber's lights flashed on extra bright, searing his retinas. Devin cursed under his breath. Locke. At your service, Captain. Why are you waking me up? There is a security matter that requires your attention. That had Devin bolting upright as his mind reconnected with the freedom. Mick Ray is attempting to breach my systems. Can he cause any harm? None whatsoever. I have severely limited what he can see, as well as access. Locke's tone held a touch of pride. Good. Have Mick Ray meet me in the captain's operations room in fifteen minutes. As you wish, Captain Sparks. The second his feet hit the cold floor, Devon realized his state of undress, boxer shorts and a t-shirt. Locke, what the hell happened to my clothes? I had the bots remove them. Clothes make the man, Captain. We wouldn't want wrinkled clothes to undermine your authority, would we? Devon shook his head, half amused, half annoyed. He wasn't even aware they had bots on board. It made sense, though, considering the ship's size and sophistication. How long did I sleep, Locke? Seven point three hours. You needed the rest. Great. Locke was now playing daddy. Devon hurried into the lavatory, the cold floor an unwelcome contrast to the warmth of his bed. He ran the faucet and splashed water on his face. The sink mirror reflected back a man he barely recognized. Since being injected with Locke's creator's DNA, he looked a good fifteen years younger. No square jaw and smiling hazel eyes like Chase Hale. That didn't stop Mendez from flirting with him. When she wanted something. Typical smuggler. Devin shook his head. Thinking about Mendez was the last thing he wanted. Particularly when he was pretty much naked. Growling at himself, Devin grabbed a towel and dried off his face. Glad that he didn't have to shave often now. One of the perks of not being fully human anymore. He dressed quickly in the uniform that he found laying on top of his bunk. The bots again. Were the damn things invisible? The uniform's fabric hugged his body like a second skin, making him feel self-conscious. Thank God the jacket that he insisted upon covered up most of his crotch. Too easy a target, that. For dirty fighting and tasteless jokes. One spot check in the mirror and Devin rushed out of his quarters. He needed to make it to the captain's operations room before Mick Ray. He did. Barely. Mick Ray waltzed in all smiles and dressed like Devin. Minus the gold V splitting the middle of the black jacket. Devin forced a smile and offered his hand. Mick Ray hurried to shake it but got a right jab to the nose instead. What the hell was that for? Mick Ray cupped his bleeding nose. Don't ever go into the Freedom Systems uninvited again, we clear? Mick Ray nodded, clearly unhappy. Clearly in pain. Dismissed. Mick Ray blinked several times as if digesting what Devin just said. Devin waited a few moments for his words to sink in, then made a brushing movement with the back of his hand. McRae took the hint and exited without another word. Chapter 9 Jessica was pretending to listen to another one of Barclay's diplomat stories when Thomas McRae sauntered into the galley. His nose was an alarming shade of crimson, even for him. Are you catching a cold or something? Jessica asked over the half-eaten chicken sandwich in her hand. A present from Captain Sparks. McRae confessed as he sat down at the table. The ship fixed my broken nose in minutes. Said the redness will go away within the hour. Barclay's fork paused midair, a morsel of food forgotten. Why in the heavens would Captain Sparks break your nose? McRae, now rummaging through a bowl of fruit, didn't look up. It was all very innocent, I assure you. Jessica raised an eyebrow. Hacking into someone's ship systems is innocent. Mick Ray pretended to look insulted. This is an alien ship, after all. Curiosity got the best of me. So did Sparks, but Jessica kept that thought to herself. Barclay, ever the diplomat, continued his meal. Understandable. Perhaps, Thomas, it would be better if you refrained from venturing into the freedom systems in the future. Of course. McRae agreed, but his eyes said, next time I won't get caught. Jessica studied McRae on the sly as she continued her lunch. 
Behind his white smile lay the heart of a criminal. A hacker could be useful. She wondered if she could persuade him to join her little mutiny. Hale might be a better option, but her gut told her that Chase Hale was smarter than he let on. And while she found him attractive, that was exactly why she didn't trust him. Sparks would be a better match if she were desperate, which she wasn't. So what? The Brahmins had impounded her ship. She would get a new one. After this alien invasion mess was over. Locke's voice interrupted her thoughts. Attention, please. All hands report to Lounge Alpha. At once. Speak of the devil. Looks like Mr. Grumpy wants an audience with his subjects. Jessica and Barclay rose, their movements synchronized in the clearing of the table. Coming, Mick Ray. Oh, I'm sure Captain Sparks doesn't mean me, said Mick Ray, taking a bite of dragon fruit. Locke's voice came from everywhere. Captain Sparks definitely means you, Thomas Mick Ray. Please hurry, you're expected. Jessica winked at Mick Ray, expecting a sly grin in return, but he remained impassive. Strange. Her wink always worked. Even on men who didn't like women. Was she losing her touch? Jessica painted on a smile anyway and followed Barclay out of the galley, leaving Mick Ray trailing behind. The travel capsule dropped them near the lounge in under three minutes. Yeah, the thing was fast, but it always made Jessica feel like she was being stuffed inside a bullet due to its shape. It took a while, but she started to notice the odd little noises and beeps the ship made too. Inside the lounge, Sparks was waiting for them. The Brahmin by his side, of course, Hale too. Well, at least he looked pleased to see her. Not that she had any intention of giving him a taste of her apple pie, as her Aunt Sophia used to say. Once again, Jessica found herself in a tiny corner of what Sparks had named a lounge. She doubted whoever created this ship had intended it to be as such. Soft amber lighting mixed with something that smelled eerily like incense. The bridge would be a more professional place to hold a meeting. Jessica caught Hale's eye. He nodded at her, then returned his attention back to Sparks. Who was she kidding? She wanted to have the meeting on the bridge so she could drool over the helm station. A hollow mist display, much smaller than the one on the bridge, appeared between them. Armantha and Arcadia took turns appearing and disappearing. Jessica scanned the faces watching the hollow mist, reading the room like a seasoned gambler. Go ahead, Locke, said Sparks. We're all here. Thank you, Captain. My task for this impromptu meeting is to provide a recap of our situation. We now know that it was the Nimbus who destroyed Armanth. Then Arcadia, the former a new Eden colony and the latter a Brahmin colony. According to Cygnus's message, human extinction is Nimbus's goal. New Eden, the Brahmin interrupted. And Brahma will most likely blame the destruction of their respective colonies on each other. Exactly, said Sparks. The Freedom is going to do its best to deliver Cygnus's warning to both the Brahma Consortium and New Eden. Sparks looked at each of them in turn. I need to know where the four of you stand. Arms crossed, Jessica dished up a plastic smile. Is that an invitation to join your crew? Nope. Sparks shot back. He was flipping his damn coin again. Mick Ray shrugged, the gesture loose and nonchalant. Since my memory's a dumpster fire, I'm open to suggestions. We stick together until we stop this invasion, Sparks said. Chase leaned in, his eyes sharp. What aren't you telling us? Spark stopped flipping his coin, his gaze sweeping the group. There's a good chance none of us will live to see another week. Jessica let out a low whistle. Worst recruitment speech ever. The ship's QI was quick to chime in. Everyone in this room has the potential to make a difference in this war. Hale guffawed. Six blasters will hardly make a difference against a thousand planet-killing spaceships. You also have me, Chase Hale. The QI's bravado didn't surprise Jessica. Mick Ray grinning at the QI's words. Did. Next stop, Spark said. Brahma. Even in this dim lighting, Barkley's face noticeably whitened. That's suicide. Exactly why they won't expect it, Sparks countered. He turned to the Brahmin, appointing her lead of the insertion team, which included Jessica and a bewildered Mick Ray. Great, I get to play chauffeur again. 
Jessica sighed, though a part of her couldn't wait to get back inside the Valkyrie again. The QI had promised that it would be ready in another day or so. Mendez, you also get to play muscle, Sparks added, a smirk crossing his face. Hale leveled a dark, almost threatening look at Sparks. Sure you don't want me to go instead? Very sure, Sparks said, his smirk lingering. What I do want is for you to come up with a plan to get the team in and out of Brahma in one piece. Can we at least have a name for our insertion team? Asked Mick Ray. Sparks turned to the Brahmin. Kara? I believe our guest should do us the honor since it was his suggestion. Everyone, including Jessica, stared at Mick Ray. How about Dragon? That's stupid. Jessica said. Make it Dragon Slayer and you got a deal. Deal. Chapter 10 Freedom Kara sidestepped a vicious slash to her face and jammed her sword deep into her opponent's stomach. The artificial construct burst into an explosion of mist and white light. Wonderful, the freedom to think as she wished, study what she liked, and the Nimbus wanted to take all of that away from her. Kara's muscles coiled and released with inhuman speed as she parried and thrust it against the increasing number of nanodigital holograms. The freedom's new gym echoed with the sound of her exertion. Each holographic enemy burst into nothingness upon defeat, their silent demise a testament to her rapidly advancing skill, with swords forbidden to all Brahmins save enforcers. And all enforcers, like starship crews, were male. The gym's doors hissed open and in walked Chase Hale. Kara ignored the man, barely managing to parry a swift sword strike aimed at her neck. Not liking an audience, Kara dispatched the remaining constructs quickly. Lucky for her, this workout was only level two. Hale clapped, which startled her. She didn't know what to say or do, especially when he pulled off his shirt. He was surprisingly hairless and, well, muscled. Kara felt a strange sensation warm her cheeks. Was this what embarrassment felt like? Hale grabbed a thin sword from the rack and smiled at her, a smile that reminded her of a shark. Care to tango, silver warrior. That made Kara feel even more self-conscious. Her aspect form was similar to Sparks. Crusts of rose quartz overlaying metal skin, except her skin was silver, as opposed to Sparks' gold. Kara didn't want to spar with Hale, but heard herself saying, I can revert back to human form if... No, stay like that. Again that smile. It suits you. Hale stepped onto the sparring mat with the ease of someone stepping into his own home. They touched swords. Chase lunged. She parried his thrust easily enough. Still, the drifter was surprisingly lithe for his bulk and moved with admirable speed. Steel sang against steel, sparks spitting like angry fireflies. Far from the amateur she expected, Chase Hale proved to be annoyingly competent with a sword. Enough to force her back several times, she sliced at his stomach, but he twisted out of reach and rewarded Kara with a sidekick. Off balance, Kara fell on her back with a thud. Chase aimed the tip of his sword at her throat. Kara shifted back into her human self, the coolness of the gym air prickling her skin. That wasn't exactly sporting. Chase flashed Kara that shark smile again, then extended his hand down to her. All is fair. He quoted, pulling her to her feet. In love and war, darling. He pulled Kara up with such force that she practically smashed into him. He was holding her by the arms now. You may release me. You sure? His lips moved closer. Before Kara could ponder the strange twist in her stomach, the gym doors opened again, and in strode Captain Sparks. Chase released her, for which she was grateful. At least she thought she was. Good timing, man, Chase said. I try. Sparks wasn't even looking at Chase. He was looking at her hopefully not trying to access her emotions. Locke had finally admitted that Sparks could shield his emotions from her, but she couldn't do the same. Even on the freedom, rank had its privileges. Chase made a show of several impressive swipes with his sword. Your turn, Captain. Swords or hand to hand. He now had Sparks' full attention. You can turn into an alien zombie if you like. Kara suspected that there was a fair chance that Chase would win. If Sparks felt any fear, his blank stare gave nothing away. I need to speak with my engineer. No problem. 
Eyes on Kara, Chase bowed, then snatched up his shirt and headed for the door. Leave the sword. Chase stopped mid-stride. For several moments, Kara thought that he might come back and insist on a match. Chase dropped the sword and exited the gym. Is there anyone that guy won't flirt with? Sparks' question broke the silence. I believe you're safe, Captain. You're smiling. Kara touched the corners of her mouth. Sparks was right, which left her more confused. She needed to distract Sparks until she could reflect upon the past few minutes in private. You could be nicer, Captain. That's your job. Really? Well, I have to check. Sparks scratched his head, his eyes looking everywhere but at her. I wanted to apologize, Kara. I had no right to dump all that emotional baggage on you. Too long flying solo, I guess. Kara tensed as she felt Sparks' mental barrier melt. He was opening up to her, helping her to see not just the captain but a solitary man burdened by unseen scars. She could relate. Kara put what she hoped was a comforting hand on Sparks' shoulder. After a lifetime of having no one respect, let alone care about my feelings, it's awkward. I suppose we both have much to learn. Sparks nodded. Yeah. I guess you're right. Chapter 11 Amusement Koda Aleph flexed his iridescent scales in agitation. This emotion, bordering on giddy, belonged to someone else. Koda sniffed the dry air, pleased at his dragon serpent form's keen sense of smell. Slowly, uncoiling from his regal perch, Koda slithered down the icy obsidian steps and into the temple's ancient halls. As if by habit, his forked tongue slipped out of his mouth, savoring the metallic tang of intrigue as Koda continued toward the source of his displeasure. Eyes alert, Koda snaked his way through the Ishtar's most revered temple. The ancient temple was a blend of antiquity and technology. The symbolic footstool of his authority and the other two lords, who wouldn't be among the living for too much longer. With a sinuous grace that belied his immense size, Koda quickly wormed his way through the temple with impressive speed. He rounded the final corner and entered the roofless chamber where the unholy sense of amusement persisted. The source of his discontent, Zadok Gimel. His rival Ishtar Lord stood in the chamber's center, looking like a piece of molten lava fallen off the side of a cliff. Hideous. More disturbing. Zadok's mouthless face seemed etched with something akin to... Glee? Floating in front of him, a seer sphere, over two meters wide, rotated with gold energy. Koda moved closer to see what was inside the image. It shimmered with images of the six humans Koda had marked for death. Your nimbus brood has failed. Zadok purred, his amusement all too obvious. The surviving Hussein managed to send a message before it was dispatched. A message that has been received and decrypted by thin human champions. Coda lashed out, his tail slamming against the temple's floor with a thunderous boom. The Nimbus were his pawns, not his progeny. Coda knew that Zadok's words were bait. Still, they held a barb of truth. These six insects could be a threat to his plans and survival. The Nimbus are but tools to my victory over you and Thane. Semantics, dear Okada. Zadok chuckled, the sound echoing like bone scraping against bone. You nurtured the vermin, then unleashed them. Now face the consequences of your failure. Koda's claws scraped against stone. The urge to tear Zadok apart was primal, intense, but a sliver of cold logic held Koda back. A direct confrontation would deplete him, leaving him vulnerable to Thane's inevitable retaliation for breaking the most sacred of rules. Why share this with me? Coda forced the words out. Zadok's laughter echoed throughout the chamber, devoid of humor, rich with malice. Distraction, of course. While you still in your impotent theory, I'll make the mind move. Logic be damned, Coda lunged a whirlwind of claws and fangs, but Zadok vanished, leaving only the faint scent of ozone and mocking laughter echoing in the vast emptiness. Fury pulsed through Coda's veins, hot and bitter. He was being played, but this wasn't over. Not by a long shot.
an entire world decimated, yet he felt nothing. Arcadia, once a vibrant world swirling with life, was now little more than a charred husk adrift in a lifeless solar system. Enforcer Chen stood at the Pegasus Bridge observation window, his dark gaze reflecting the inferno raging on the planet's surface. An unsettling emptiness gnawed at him, a vacuum where no emotion stirred. Perhaps the alien Zadok was right. Symbosium clouds one's judgment. All his life, Chen believed that the Symbosium medication controlling emotions was a good thing. Logical. But staring at Arcadia's pyre, a chilling doubt crept in. This couldn't be right. From his command station, oblong metal and half his height, Chen scanned the bridge. The faces of his fellow enforcers were impassive as statues while the Pegasus slowly maneuvered its way through the graveyard of destroyed ships. Brahmin ships, with hundreds of dead enforcers. No one showed a hint of grief, no tremor of anger, just cold obedience. Reminding Chen that he was overdue for his shot of symbosium. Zadok told him to stop using it, but Chen didn't fully trust him. The alien had his own agenda, and Chen had little doubt that Zadok was an alien, despite claiming himself to be some kind of god. With the power to materialize in and out of a warship at will, he might as well be a god. Observing the shattered ships floating in the darkness of space, Chen's mind drifted back to the phantom flames licking at his skin, a searing reminder of the Brotherhood's re-education. He shivered at the memory of Zadok's fingers around his throat. The alien's touch was as bad as the virtual flames that had engulfed his body. Almost. Scars of the mind deeper than flesh. Wagner's voice jolted Chen back to the present. Anomaly detected near Arcadia and Fossa Chen. Static? Doubtful. Chen didn't believe in coincidences. Pinpoint it. Identify its nature. Barely two minutes later, Wagner had an answer for him. His voice held a slight tremor of disbelief. Sir, it seems to be a data burst. Not Brahmin, not New Eden. Chen's pulse quickened. It had to be the alien invaders. He had heard rumors about New Eden's Armanth colony being similarly dispatched. Get a team of Xenotechs and cryptographers on it. Priority one. Chen still had no idea where the invaders came from, definitely not from the system's arc gate, which ruled out New Eden as being responsible for Arcadia's death. The Brotherhood, particularly the Guardians, would still pin the blame on the New Eden Empire, as good an excuse as any to start a war. Not his concern. Those were matters for the Guardians. What bothered Chen was the fact that the invaders had simply vanished, and none, not one of their ships had been destroyed in the skirmish between them and Brahman warships. And for Sir Chen, Wagner said once again interrupting his ruminations, The Brotherhood demands our immediate return. Raised eyebrows was the only reaction Chen allowed himself. Orders to return to Brahma were indeed a surprise. However, his recent failures left little room for requesting additional information. Fortunately, whatever destroyed Arcadia didn't bother with the Arc Gate, so they could reach Brahma within hours. Was the Mother World under attack? Most likely not, although according to Zadok, it would soon be. Perhaps this recall had something to do with the traitor Kara, Sparks, and his stolen alien ship. Chen almost smiled. He had a score to settle. Helm. Chen's voice resonated throughout the bridge. Plot a course for the gate. We have people to kill. Chapter 12 Jessica was expecting something a little more... bulkier. Yeah, this so-called battle suit that Locke had made for her with its gunmetal white and scarlet designs was beyond exquisite, but would it even stop one laser blast? Jessica continued inspecting her armored forearms while McCray and Kara checked their armor. Battle suit? She drawled. This looks more like something a fashion model would wear on some futuristic spacewalk photo shoot. They were in the Freedom's hangar bay and Jessica felt practically naked. Her battle suit felt more like a second skin. It shouted freedom, not firepower. Seriously, Sparks? Her voice echoed in the hangar's vastness, particularly since there was only one fighter ship in it. Sure this getup isn't some sick fantasy of yours. If it were, Sparks said and pointed to Mick Ray. He wouldn't be in it. 
A disembodied chuckle rippled through the air. Don't let the battle suit's looks deceive you, Captain Mendez. Your suit's polymer graphene weave is light and flexible, yet can still deflect a plasma cannon like a pebble. Eye-controlled menus, enhanced vision modes, increased strength and speed. It's the ultimate soldier upgrade. Sparks actually grinned. As always, Locke, we appreciate the info dump. My pleasure, Captain Sparks. Sparks winked at Barkley, who was shaking his head, but smiling. Jessica, her gray eyes scanning for any imperfections on the Valkyrie, was only half listening now. True to his word, the ship's QI had fixed her beautiful ship. On the outside, at least. She would have to run some quick checks once she got into the pilot's capsule. The Valkyrie was much smaller than her old Falcon, but then again, the Falcon had been hers. A pang of loss tugged at her heart, but the sleek, smooth lines of the Valkyrie drew Jessica in. Spark's gruff voice destroyed the moment. Mick Ray, bring my engineer back in one piece. Mick Ray flashed a smile that could rival the sheen of the Valkyrie itself. You can trust me, Captain. Spark's look said that he didn't trust Mick Ray, which confirmed her suspicions. Mick Ray played loose with rules in the law. When she returned to the Freedom, and that was a big if since they were infiltrating Brahma's homeworld, she would see if she could recruit Mick Ray to her cause. A hacker would be just the thing to take over this ship. Barclay would never go along with her coup. And Hale. Hmm. He was the only one not present, making Jessica wonder what he was up to. The Brahmin finally spoke up. We should be leaving, Captain. Sparks nodded, his expression unreadable. Yeah, you're right. Good luck. For a moment, Jessica wondered if Sparks was sweet on the Brahmin, then discarded the notion as silly. She was a lot closer to Sparks' type than Kara with no last name. Unbidden, the Valkyrie's opening slid into its roof. Jessica swallowed the urge to do a victory dance. The Valkyrie. Her Valkyrie. Not yet, but soon. If she survived this second suicide mission. Seconds after she made it into the fighter ship, Jessica vaulted into the cockpit, the foamy seat morphing around her. She tapped a button just below her capsule smart glass, and the Valkyrie's opening slid shut. Everything looked normal. Fixed. Jessica activated the engines and closed her eyes in bliss. Perfect. She hit the intercom. Buckle up, folks. It's going to be a bumpy night. The less people around, the better. Chase slipped into the Freedom's engineering section, the alien tech thrumming with vibrations and blinking consoles. Yeah, this place was a real treasure trove of potential sabotage. Bypassing the security took longer than expected. Fifteen minutes and forty-six seconds. He chalked his disappointing stats up to the alien tech. At least, he didn't get caught. He couldn't have planned things better. Chase mused, a smirk playing on his lips. Though thanks to Sparks, he did have a hand in the planning. Hopefully Jessica and Kara wouldn't get themselves killed, though it was highly unlikely they would survive. He wouldn't mind getting into either of their pants. Chase smiled at the thought as his eyes scanned the maze of metal gray terminals, their alien symbols glowing with cryptic purpose. He and Jessica would probably break some furniture once they got going. But there was also something about Kara, a primal allure that transcended his usual games. Maybe it was the challenge, the way she resisted his advances. He noted the two colossal cylinders, their hum resonating through the floor. Generators? Engines, maybe? Sparks had been evasive about the details of how the Freedom was powered, though thanks to Mick Ray, Chase did find out that the ship can recycle, replicate, and fabricate parts and supplies. Chase pulled out his homemade bomb, made mostly with items from his clothes in the ship's galley. Now where to plant it? Chase knelt down by a terminal near the two large cylinders. He opened the bottom panel. Just as he prepared to plant the bomb, a voice sliced through the silence. You are in an unauthorized area, Agent Chase Hale. Chase froze, the blood draining from his face. The ship's QI lock called him Agent. He was in serious trouble. Oh, my mistake, Chase said, finishing his sabotage with practiced nonchalance. Must have taken a wrong turn. I am a quantum intelligence. 
Locke replied, its voice full of contempt. Underestimate my acumen at your own peril. Not exactly a veiled threat. Standing up, Chase shut the console with a decisive click. You're delaying the inevitable, Locke. New Eden will have this ship. New Eden will be no more. If we do not stop the invaders... We? Your skills and sharp mind, though highly limited, will serve us well. Sounded like the QI was calling him stupid. He had been called worse. A lot worse. What set Chase on edge, almost as much as getting caught, was how the quantum computer was leaving sparks out of the equation. I already have a boss, Locke. Chase said, testing the waters. Oh, yes. Commander Miriam Wellington, head of New Eden's intelligence agency. Chase felt his body stiffen. Locke seemed to know everything. Was his implant compromised? Impossible. He was going to have to take this computer down. Hopefully the freedom could run without it. You are expendable to Wellington, Locke said. Chase gritted his teeth. I'm one of her best agents. There was no point lying to the QI. How it found out so much information about him, maybe his comm implant, shouldn't be possible. There were safeguards against that. Are you aware, Agent Hale, that the communication implant inside your skull has a kill switch? Locke's words were like a jab to the face, one he couldn't dodge. What do you think Wellington will do if you somehow manage to hand her the freedom? She would probably activate the kill switch and grab the freedom for herself. He would like to think better of Wellington, but her ambition just might trump her patriotism, and he wouldn't be the only agent she'd kill. Didn't matter. He always completed a mission no matter what. Back off, Locke. Chase growled, pulling out his EMP trigger. One press of this button in your precious engineering section has a little meltdown. Really? The world dissolved around him. He was no longer in engineering, but inside one of Freedom's huge corridors, his homemade EMP bomb laying harmlessly on the floor. Panic clawed at his throat. He'd been played, a puppet in the QI's elaborate scheme. Forget it, Locke. I'm not joining you. Then you will die. A piercing whine filled the air, causing Chase to instinctively clamp his hands over his ears. In his peripheral vision, he caught a flashing orange light. Chase dived for the floor. A sizzling beam of light sliced into the spot where he was moments ago. He scrambled to his feet and made a break for the exit. If he could get to Sparks and take him down, maybe... The door slammed shut. Very nice, Agent Hale. Locke's voice echoed. Glowing spheres materialized from the corridor's ribbed walls, surrounding him like angry hornets. Unfortunately, there is no escape. From me. Chapter 13 The pragmatist in her told Kara that something was bound to go wrong. Slipping through Brahma's orbital defense system should have been nigh impossible. And yet, here they were, a silent shadow against Andromeda City's glittering skyline. Between the Valkyrie's stealth capabilities and Mendez's expert, if a bit wild, flying, they were about to land on top of one of Brahma's largest broadcast stations. Valkyrie, the female warriors in ancient Norse mythology who carried the dead to heaven, hopefully not their corpses. She found it surprising that Sparks didn't immediately change the ship's name. Sparks didn't like Mendez. However, that small fact didn't stop his eyes from occasionally straying to the pilot's ample chest. Was Mendez Chase's type too? Enough of silly ruminations, Kara. Focus on the mission. She touched the breastplate near her throat to talk to Mendez since the pilot capsule dome was set on black opaque. Executing phase two. Mick Ray, quite the picture of unease in his borrowed armor, shifted. Phase two? You were at Hale's briefing, Mick Ray, were you not? Right. He mumbled, fiddling with his helmet. Though honestly, I wasn't really paying attention. Kara suppressed a sigh. Time was a luxury they didn't have. With a tap on her wrist, she sent silent commands to the Valkyrie, the ship responding with a surge of power. They needed a distraction. A low-impact missile streaked from the underbelly of the ship, exploding seconds later near the colossal broadcast tower. No casualties. It being night, only enforcers would be out on the streets. And with the fireworks she just made, 
They would come running like rats. I could have put that closer. Mendez grumbled into Kara's ear via her helmet. Duly noted, Kara said. Continue to the LZ. She wouldn't mention her ability to override the ship's controls with a mere thought. Mendez would balk at that when she found out. But not tonight. The Valkyrie settled onto the tower's rooftop with a shudder, the city lights sprawling beneath them like a jeweled web. They exited quickly. There were no guards, most likely gone to see what happened on the street, unless someone with half a brain stops them. Check your sidearm. Kara told McRae, her gaze flitting across the cityscape. You don't have to tell me that. He muttered, patting his hip. His hand froze. Wait, how did you know? Is your neural implant connected to our weapons? Ignoring his questions, Kara turned to Mendez. I'll take point. I got rear. Mendez double-checked her weapon. The stairwell into the station was naturally locked. Kara stepped to the side. Don't worry. McRae said, stepping up with his worn-looking pouch. I've got this. The man proved quite capable. They were winding down the stairwell within seconds. Kara accessed her quantum implant to hack into the station's schematics to locate the broadcast room. Seventh floor, east wing. Fifty meters to target location just around the corner. Kara held up her right fist, signaling for them to stop. Adrenaline pumping, Kara dared a quick peek around the corner. Two guards, both armed with pulse rifles, confirming the rumors. Despite the Brotherhood's total rule, there were still people who resisted. Why else have armed guards at a broadcast station? Kara nodded at McRae, who immediately tapped frantically at his wrist comm. The shrill wail of a fire alarm tore through the silence. One guard rushed straight down the hall without looking their way. Kara shot him in the back, sending him sliding several meters. Mendez blasted the guard by the door in the neck. Too much blood. Hopefully they would be able to keep the deaths to a minimum. Kara hurried to the fallen guard's side and snatched up his ID card. She was back on her feet in seconds. The guard's ID card now hovered over the door's security panel. Ready? Jessica positioned herself near the right side of the door. Ready. Kara hit the door panel. As it slid open, Jessica tossed a blackout grenade into the ensuing gap. Kara slammed her hand down hard on the panel, forcing the door to close again. She held up both hands and counted down to ten, then rushed inside, hoping the screaming fire alarm would keep the guards busy. If there were enforcers around, things would get complicated. Technicians lay scattered on the floor, none of them dead. Blackout grenades only cause loss of consciousness. Kara pointed to the bank of consoles circling a hollow screen. Get to work, Mick Ray. On it. Kara checked Mendez's position by the door. Good. Despite her questionable motives, the woman certainly knew how to secure a room. This is some low-grade equipment, Mick Ray said. But I think... I might be able to send data packets of Cygnus's warning to Brahmin colonies as well. That was more than she expected. Do it. A cold voice sliced through the silence. Belay that order. That voice. But where was Enforcer Chen? Impossibly. The air rippled and tore. Enforcer Chen stepped out of that tear in reality his dark gaze fixed on them and his sword glinting in the control room's dimness. Kara's blood turned to ice. This wasn't part of the plan. Mendez, protect Mick Ray. But do it. She snapped, shoving the bewildered hacker behind her. This was certainly not the time for sentimentality. Where were the other enforcers? Perhaps she would make it out of this building alive after all. A single thought was all it took to extend her left arm's long blade. Kara lunged, her forearm blade extended like a viper's strike. Enforcer Chen parried with his own sword, the impact vibrating through her bones despite her battle suit and increased strength. Chen feigned right, then whirled left. The edge of his sword sparked against Kara's left side, causing her to misstep, leaving her midsection exposed. Chen rushed forward to take advantage, but laser blasts to his chest caused him to stop. Mendez, rushing toward Chen. Payback, Enforcer. Two small metal cylinders zipped out of Chen's gloved wrist. Whipping through the air, they separated, held together by wire, and wrapped around Mendez's legs, sending her crashing to the floor. 
Kara sliced her blade at Chen's neck. He dodged her strike easily. Damn. She wasn't used to fighting with a weapon attached to her arm. She wasn't used to fighting at all outside of mandatory training. Chen, fueled by years of honed skill, moved with an economy of motion, every strike precise and lethal. A blur of silver at her face sent Kara backpedaling. Despite her alien-enhanced speed, it was blindingly obvious that Chen was the better swordsman and warrior. The best she could hope for was to delay him long enough for Mikrae to get Cygnus's warning out to her people. Enforcer Chen landed blow after blow, each one resonating through her armor. Each hit she felt. The kick to her left calf was unexpected. She fell hard on her butt. Chen's blade crashed towards her neck. Mendez slammed into Chen, sending them both splashing across the floor. Her respite was short-lived. A guttural roar echoed through the control room's chamber, shaking the very floor. The air rippled again, this time between her and Mick Ray, who was still busy at the consoles. Not a tear in the fabric of reality this time. Kara stared at the effervescent blue circle fading into existence. Out of it came a nightmare. Ah, human meat. The creature's words seemed to vibrate in Kara's skull. Vaguely humanoid, the thing smelled terrible, like discarded dumpster meat. Its upper body, insanely muscled, reminded Kara of an ape. Chitinous plates adorned its chest and shoulders, no doubt made the thing harder to kill. From the waist down, all semblance of humanity vanished. Four segmented legs like a spider, thick and tipped with wickedly sharp points. Its sword was almost as thick as its massive arms, and the sword was glowing. Nimbus. The alien invaders who had slaughtered Arcadia and Armanth. Kara bolted to her feet as the Nimbus skittered toward Mick Ray. Ladies? Stammered Mick Ray. Help! Chen unleashed two cylinders, the same trick he ensnared Mendez with. Each cylinder whipped around the Nimbus's thick back legs. The Nimbus's furry brows furrowed as he glanced down and snapped the wire trying to trip him. Kara pulled out her laser and blasted the creature in the back, as did Mendez. The Nimbus turned away from Mick Ray, scowled in their direction, and rushed toward them with frighteningly fast speed. Raising its giant sword, the Nimbus swatted Kara and Mendez like flies, sending them both tumbling away. Every part of her hurt, breathing hurt. Systems compromised. Rebooting. Kara ignored the coppery taste of blood in her mouth and looked up. The portal had completely vanished, and the Nimbus scurried toward Mick Ray, whose back was turned. It reached out for the hacker, then roared. The creature spun around and howled at Chen, who had speared the thing in its back with a lance now embedded in its left shoulder. Why the Enforcer was helping them, Kara had no clue. But she wouldn't refuse the assistance. Now it was three against one, and it still wasn't enough. The Nimbus grabbed an unconscious technician from the floor and hurled it at Kara and Chen, sending them both scrambling. Got it! shouted Mick Ray. Chen rose, glancing at Mick Ray before staring at Kara. Then my work is done. Once again, the air rippled and split. Chen offered a mock bow, then leapt through the tear in reality, leaving them behind. The silence was shattered by a scream. The Nimbus, its broad sword dripping with blood, hovered over Mendez on her back but still in her battle suit, and missing an arm. Such a pretty little warrior, the Nimbus hissed, but so fragile. Despair threatened to drown Kara, but she forced the emotion back down. Mendez needed her. She reached for the grenade magnetized to her belt. Mick Ray, Kara said into McRae's helmet speaker. Close your eyes. What? Just do it. The Nimbus stopped licking the blood on its sword and glared at Kara. She tossed the flash grenade at its spider legs. Blinding light exploded in the chamber. The Nimbus roared, much like an animal. Kara rushed to Mendez's side. There was so much blood she nearly slipped on it, but managed to pull Mendez away from the Nimbus. Alarms started wailing again, only adding to her growing headache. She kept her hands steady as Mick Ray helped her fix a tourniquet on Mendez's bleeding stump. Guards would be here soon. Enforcers, too. Possibly. Time to leave, she told Mick Ray. Who's going to fly the Valkyrie? Mick Ray asked. Kara stood up. Mendez cradled in her arms. It will have to be me. Chapter 14 Chase woke to moving stars. Actually, he was surprised that he woke up at all, 
especially after getting zapped by that damn QI. He blinked, adjusting to the orange glow cast by the curved wall surrounding him. With a groan, Chase rolled onto his back to see what gave him such a great view of space. The walls and ceiling were cylindrical and ribbed and glowing warm orange. He blinked, trying to force away his grogginess, then sat up, wincing at the dull ache in his skull. A round hatch sat in the middle of a wall, the only way out set for the glass wall behind him that led to space. He accessed his implant, out 40 minutes. Not bad, considering he felt like a wet rag tossed into a fusion reactor. Stale air tickled his nose as he looked over his shoulder at the ceiling-length view of space. Crap, he was in a damn airlock. How are you feeling, Chase Hale? The voice came from everywhere. Been better, Locke. At least the QI wasn't calling him agent anymore. How did I get here? My bots brought you. Why? To give you one last chance to accept my offer. Chase intended to keep the QI talking as long as possible while he tried to figure a way out. I'm not much for threats, Locke. I am a quantum intelligence, Chase Hale. I do not make threats. I merely present facts as they are. Chase didn't believe the QI for one second. It had its own agenda, one that Sparks probably wasn't even aware of. But you know who I am. And know your mission as well. The QI sounded amused. Which begs the question, why do you want me to join the crew? Is this what you call a delaying tactic, Chase Hale? Call me Chase. Seconds went by. Maybe a minute. Finally, Locke spoke again. The Freedom is a large ship. I need a crew of at least six in order to defeat the invaders. And if I still say no? Humanity may well become extinct, and you, Chase Hale, will be given an up-close view of the cold vacuum of space. Visiting his inner sanctum on the Nimbus flagship, was like stepping into the belly of a leviathan, rarely a pleasant experience. Shadows clung to the obsidian walls like barnacles on a sunken ship. The air, thick with incense of forgotten deities, felt heavy on Kota Aleph's non-existent lungs. He contemplated Morden, the hulking beast kneeling before him through the dead reptilian eyes of the Sanctum's dragon serpent statue. Rise. Coda said, making his voice sound like wind whistling through a crypt. Morden obeyed, the faint blue glow emanating from wounds hastily stitched across his chitinous shoulder. You are right, Morden said. The humans were warning the Brahmins. And you let them, hissed Coda. Morden bristled, his clawed fingers clicking in agitation. As per your orders. The defiance simmering beneath his words was unmistakable. I could have killed them all. Humans are weak and quite tasty. Poor nearsighted creature could not fathom the value of allowing one's enemies to dig their own graves. Stop pouting, Morden. Coda said, his ruby eyes dancing. This is your fault, after all. Morden scowled at the accusation but said nothing. Coda continued. Had you done away with this saying like you were supposed to, the humans would have never received a warning. He would have also never gotten a look at their strange ship. Not human-made. Interesting curved design. With stealth that even he found difficult to track and impossible once they were inside slip space. I wonder which race created it. Coda wondered. And how does Thing think he can possibly use it? Did you give my little gift to the humans? Morden, still sulking, mumbled a grudging, Yes. Coda roared. A shockwave swept Morden off his legs and slammed him into a wall. The creature slid down to the floor, visibly shaken. Yes, what? Hatred flashed in Morden's wood-brown eyes, but he quickly hit it. Yes, Dreadlord. Good. Coda smiled to himself. One more piece off the plane board. You may leave. Coda Aleph chuckled as he watched Morden scurry off into the darkness. The Nimbus were powerful, yes, but lacked subtlety. They were pawns, useful tools in his grand game, but ultimately expendable. As were the humans inside the alien ship, 
once he found out their ship's secrets. Devin stared at Mendez's comatose body lying on the medbay's thin bed. Sharp nose, high cheekbones, kissable lips. Devin killed the thought and assessed the iron weight settling in his gut. An unconscious glance at the empty arm sleeve of Mendez's uniform made that weight heavier. This was exactly what he didn't want. Being responsible for other people. Them dying. Because of orders. His decisions. I shouldn't have sent you. Of course, Mendez couldn't hear him, but Locke did. You did what you thought best. And almost got Mendez killed. Devin glanced at the sarcophagus on the opposite side of the med bay, currently housing his engineer. Kara almost died too. Devin's gaze lingered on the closed sarcophagus, a tomb for the living where Kara lay. Resting, rejuvenating Locke called it. Devin turned back to Mendez. He remembered the vibrant fire in her seductive gray eyes. Devin shook his head, disgusted with himself. We should have brought Mendez to Medbay sooner. Everyone has to go through decontamination once they return to the ship. Good thing, too. A holographic image flickered to life above Mendez's still form, revealing a tiny Kafka-esque creature. Spidery legs twitching, mandibles glinting under the soothing blue light. What the hell is that? I am uncertain at this time. Locke's voice remained unruffled. Some kind of tracking device is my preliminary hypothesis. Devin stared at the alien thing, thoroughly revolted. Where did you find it? Inside Captain Mendez. It's organic. I have isolated it inside a containment jar for further study. Devin nodded, his eyes returning to Mendez. I need you to save her, Locke. I know you can do it. He had reviewed the med bay's capabilities in mere minutes thanks to his quantum implant and connection to the freedom. Too bad he didn't understand most of it. We've already discussed this, Captain Sparks. She's lost too much blood, and no one on board has her blood type. Meaning she was going to die unless... If I agree, will you be able to fix her arm too? He already knew the answer. Yes, Captain. Devon swallowed, grimacing at the morbid taste of bile in his mouth. She's going to hate me for doing this to her. Mendez thinks I'm some kind of metal zombie. A gross mischaracterization. You are still quite human. Yeah, thought Devon, just not human enough. He glanced back to Mendez, her ashen face haunting him. Well, this was just going to be another bad decision he was going to have to live with. Better than having Jessica dying on him. Maybe. Wasn't that long ago he wanted to be rid of the woman. How long will it take, Locke? 5.3 hours should suffice if I dedicate resources to the procedure. Do it then. Make Mendez one of us. Devin patted Mendez's shoulder, then stepped back. He watched as the medbay bed floated towards one of the five remaining sarcophagi, briefly remembering the horror of waking up in one. Yeah, it was a transition-slash-rejuvenation unit, but it still reminded Devon of an ancient sarcophagus. The medbay doors whooshed open and in walked Ambassador Barclay and Mick Ray, their faces etched with tension. How's Jessica? Barclay asked, his dark eyes full of concern. She'll be better than you in a few hours, Locke said. Barclay's frown deepened. So, why don't you look happy, Captain? Mick Ray cut him off before he could answer. Where did that come from? Mick Ray's eyes, usually warm and friendly, were now cold and hard, as he pointed to the holographic image of the creature thing Locke had discovered. I said, where did that come from? Devin snapped out of his stupor. He'd never heard such ice in Mick Ray's voice before. Locke thinks it's a tracker of sorts. Devin was now on high alert. Mick Ray's demeanor was completely different, his voice sharp and clipped. Is it still on board? Why, yes, Locke said. Get rid of it now. Mick Ray's hand shot towards a nearby console, but Devon grabbed his wrist and squeezed hard. Why? The ship lurched violently, throwing them off balance. The lights flickered and died, plunging the med bay into utter darkness. That's why. Chapter 15 Locke? The quantum intelligence didn't respond to Devon's mental queries either, causing a cold dread to spread in Devon's gut. 
Things couldn't possibly get worse. He knew they would, though. On the plus side, the medbay's power had come back on, and more importantly, so did life support. The red emergency lights cast the Freedom's medbay in an unsettling glow, highlighting the worry lines on Barclay's forehead, as well as a strangely composed mick ray. At least they were all accounted for. Hale, for some reason, was in an airlock. What in the high heavens happened? Asked Barclay. Devon accessed his quantum implant to scan the ship. Most sections were offline, their status reports returning nothing but error codes. The areas that he could assess were a sea of flashing red alerts. Panic rose in his chest, but he forced it down, focusing on the immediate crisis. We fell out of FTL, Devon said, moving to check on Kara and Mendez. Mick Ray grabbed him, his grip surprisingly strong. Where's the alien tracker? His voice was urgent, didn't even sound like Mick Ray. Devon snatched his arm back, glaring at Mick Ray, who didn't even have the decency to flinch. Devon pointed towards the med bay's rear, where an opaque stained glass window concealed the entrance to the lab. It's in there. We need to destroy it. Mick Ray wasted no time, hurrying towards the lab and disappearing behind the colored glass. Devon and Barkley exchanged looks before following Mick Ray into the lab. The lab, like the med bay, was relying on emergency power. It, however, maintained its neon blue lighting. In the center of the room, an orb of reinforced glass housed the alien tracker, its spidery leg still twitching. Mick Ray swiped his right hand through the air. A glowing white holographic display and keyboard materialized out of thin air. That stunt shouldn't be possible unless Devon explicitly granted him access. Destroy that thing, please, Mick Ray said, gesturing dismissively towards the orb. Barclay nodded, his long face grim. Seems the sensible thing to do. Devon hesitated, his mind struggling to connect the dots. Mick Ray's unauthorized access and strange behavior, the unknown threat of the tracker. It all pointed towards a deeper, darker truth. He felt lost. Worse. He actually missed Locke. Devon shook his head to clear his thoughts and closed his eyes, focusing on the orb. In his mind's eye, he saw the mini-disc it rested on, a pulsing conduit of energy. With a grimace, he sent a surge of a hundred volts through it. Just to be sure, the tracker inside crackled and sparked, then fell limp, a charred husk at the bottom of the orb. Nicely done. Mick Ray eyed Devon like he was some kind of prize specimen, then turned to leave. I need to get to the bridge. Devon grabbed him before he could take a step. Mick Ray pulled away with surprising strength, his eyes locking with Devon's. They were no longer the warm, friendly eyes Devon knew. The eyes boring into him now were cold, calculating, and held a glint of something... sinister. Why the bridge? Devon said, his voice tight. The lab door whooshed open. Kara, looking refreshed and composed, entered the lab. She waved a blaster in Mick Ray's direction. Please answer the captain. Mick Ray sighed. I'll have greater access to your computer and ship's systems. Mick Ray explained, his gaze skewering each of them. I can only do so much in this so-called medical facility. Why should I trust you with the freedom? Devon said, trying his best to sound in control. Mick Ray's thick lips curled into a humorless smile. Your quantum computer is down, we're stranded in interstellar space, and humanity is about to get wiped out. He looked around at everyone, his eyes burning with a chilling intensity. Any further questions? Revenge. The bittersweet taste of it filled Chen's mouth as he stepped through Zadok's portal and into Tetra Hall. The portal's incessant buzzing and bright lights were annoying but it was worth it. Chen stood in the center of the gaudy rotunda, surveying the seven ancient faces, etched with wrinkles that spoke of both intelligence and cruelty. The faces that watched him burn virtually on his own ship. Guardians of the Brotherhood. Guardian DuPont, current chairman, rose from his high back seat and glared down at Chen from the council dais. Infosa Chen, what is the meaning of this? Choosing not to answer, Chen took in his opulent surroundings. A dome ceiling painted with scenes of past conquests looked down upon him. The marble floor was polished to a mirror shine, most definitely a stark contrast to the utilitarian training grounds where he'd honed his fighting skills. 
Chen shifted his gaze to his mentor, Guardian Taggart, frowning, disappointment in his eyes. Guardian Oliver, a wiry man with a hawk-like face, scowled in confusion. Chen offered him a cruel smile, shaking his head like a disappointed parent. You can stop clutching your pearls, Oliver. The doors are sealed. The color drained from Oliver's face, replaced by a flush of anger. Whether it was Chen's assertion or his omission of the Guardian's honorific, Chen didn't care. He, not these worthless men, was in control. DuPont slammed his fist on the dais. How did you get in here? This time, you really will burn at the stake. Chen scanned the room, his gaze lingering on each Guardian before settling back on DuPont. He whipped out his blaster and fired, incinerating DuPont's face. The poor man didn't even have time to scream. His body slumped onto the desk, the stench of burnt flesh filling the chamber. A shocked silence descended, broken only by the rasping breaths of the remaining guardians. Even Taggart, his unshakable mentor, looked ruffled. How long you been off Symposium, Chen? Not nearly long enough. Taggart nodded and almost smiled. What do you want? Chen gave a low, mocking bow. A warning was broadcasted across Brahma and all our colonies. An alien invasion is upon us. Why do I not see the gears of war turning? These so-called aliens, said Guardian Wallace, they are at New Eden's doorstep, not ours. This is a golden opportunity to break New Eden. And what of Arcadia? Chen spat, surprised at his reaction. Regrettable, Taggart replied coolly. Stupidity. Chen countered, his voice rising. While you squabble over scraps, the real enemy grows stronger. Taggart showed Chen his blaster, pointing straight at him. Watch your tongue, Enforcer, before you lose it. Chen grinned as the air rippled beside him. Gasps all around as Zadok stepped out of the portal, his molten rock visage casting long, menacing shadows across the Guardian's perfect marble floor. Why are they still breathing? Zadok said, his voice sounding like the grinding of tectonic plates. Chen looked up at Zadok, meeting the alien's angry gaze with confidence. They are about to make me guardian of the Brahma military forces. Never, hissed Guardian Oliver. Zadok looked at the guardian as if he were a piece of talking furniture, then swiped his massive hand at him. A jagged stalagmite erupted from the floor, instantly impaling Oliver to his chair. Even Taggart. The epitome of composure couldn't hide a grimace at the brutal display. He recovered quickly enough, though. So I ask again, Chen. Guardian Chen. Taggart's green eyes narrowed, but then he offered a curt nod. What do you want? Guardian. Chen met his mentor's cold eyes with a grin. I demand full control of the Brahma naval forces. We are going to Shahar. He looked up at Zadok, towering over him like a vengeful god then back at Taggart. I have a war to win. As silent as the vacuum of space, except for the whispers of recycled air keeping them alive, most of the freedom's power was still out. Kara hated to admit it to herself, but she felt empty, no doubt due to her connection, or rather lack of connection, to the ship. The bridge was bathed in ominous red lights, casting unflattering shadows over Barkley and Sparks both who stood tense and watchful over Mick Ray. The man she journeyed with to Brahma was unrecognizable now, his demeanor cold. Alien. Barkley and Sparks watched Mick Ray work on a hollow station that he had created with the snap of his fingers. From his posture to his voice, Mick Ray seemed far different from the jovial man who she'd come to know. In some ways, he didn't even seem human. To be fair, neither was she. Not completely. Anymore. Mick Ray's hands blurred across the desk-wide hollow display, scrolling through menus and screens so fast that even with her enhanced vision, Kara could barely keep up. Mick Ray's screen had replaced the bridge's hollow mist. Not that they needed to see outside, not much out there but the blackness of interstellar space. Chase leaned over much too close. She could practically feel his heat, which was odd since the bridge's temperature was several degrees colder than normal. Shouldn't you be in engineering or something? Kara shook her head. We have a software, not a hardware problem. As the ship's engineer, I can control engineering systems from anywhere on the Freedom. Chase served up a smile bordering on lascivious. He wants something, besides me. 
Sparks is right. We can't trust him. Sparks' deep voice cut through the silence. What are you? Mikray turned away from the hollow station. Kara's breath stuttered. Mikray's eyes were now solid green and glowing as he met Sparks' gaze. I am someone who plans to win this war. Kara had her blaster in her hand and aimed at Mikray in seconds. So did Sparks and Chase. Though how Chase was able to retrieve his blaster from the armory, she wasn't certain. Barkley, forever the diplomat, cleared his throat and offered a calming smile. Let's give our new friend a chance to speak, shall we? My friends don't have creepy glowing eyes, Chase said. No offense, Sparks. Sparks didn't smile back. Go ahead, speak. I am Ishtar. Mick Ray said, his voice laced with authority that sent shivers down Kara's spine. It was times like these that she missed the calming effects of Symbosium. Nimbus is our enemy. Mick Ray swept his gaze across them, his glowing green eyes mesmerizing. You are my champions. That elicited a chuckle from Chase. Uh, I don't recall you asking. Mick Ray paid no heed to Chase, turning his attention to Devon. Koda Aleph, my fellow Ishtar and rival, has infected your quantum computer and ship with a self-replicating virus. Locke isn't a computer, Devon growled. He's a quantum intelligence. Precisely what makes this ship and you worthy of my patronage, Mick Ray said. Your QI also appears to be sentient, which is quite fascinating. That might explain how it's managing to keep Coda's virus from completely overwhelming the ship. Mick Ray resumed working. Barely a minute later, the bridge's lights flickered back to life. Kara blinked, adjusting to the sudden brightness. On her retinal overlay, the Freedom's power readings climbed steadily. Hope sparked in her chest. She quickly dismissed the emotion. Logic, not emotion, was needed. That was Beck, Barclay said, his voice tinged with relief. Kara turned away from the engineering station. 50% and rising. Barclay turned to Mick Ray instead of her or Sparks. How much do we need for FTL? 63% at a minimum. Mick Ray said, his attention never leaving his holographic screens. Kara didn't like the way he knew so much about the ship. The Freedom held many secrets, many of which kept them out of Brahma and New Eden's grip. But if Mick Ray could get them back into slip space, she wouldn't complain. Sparks, however, might. His suspicion of Mick Ray rolled off him in waves. You have a destination in mind, I suppose. Mick Ray chuckled but kept his eyes on his hollow screens. Don't worry, Captain. We're still going to Shahar. That's where the Nimbus will attack next. Chase snorted. How can you be so sure? The Freedom's QI predicted it. Mick Ray said, his fingers flying across the virtual interface. And I agree. The Brahma Navy might arrive before us. Hopefully, New Eden will have an armada already there. And why would they do that? Chase pressed. They don't know the Nimbus are coming. Mick Ray raised an eyebrow. Thanks for volunteering. It's your job to make certain they do. Kara, please assist the lad. He turned back to his screens. Why do I feel like I've just been dismissed? Because you're smart that way. Kara led Chase to the comm station on the other side of the bridge. Can you bring Locke back? Kara could almost feel Mick Ray freeze. He then looked away from his hollow screens at Sparks. The only way to bring Locke and the ship back, it needs a crew. Sparks folded his arms. Freedom has a crew. The Freedom, Captain, has three frequencies. And one of them is getting her arm sewed back on. Barclay put a friendly hand on Sparks' shoulder. How many people? At a minimum? Four. Five would be better. Kara could feel Sparks getting angrier. What if we don't? Mick Ray gave Sparks a smile that reminded Kara of Enforcer Chen. Evil. We can't get back into slip space. Coda's virus takes over the ship. Lock and everyone here dies. Including you? Kara heard herself say. Mick Ray actually looked at her this time. Eventually, yes. Though I suspect Coda will prolong my death. Are you volunteering? There was no humor in Sparks' voice. This body is on a loan. 
integrate the ambassador and the new Eden spy instead. Chase spun around from the station, hands up in surrender. Me and Locke had a big discussion about that before he went AWOL. Kara felt cold, uncertain why she felt disappointed about Chase's treachery. She could tell that Sparks was ready to morph into his aspect and pounce on Chase. Barkley beat him to it. I hereby volunteer to integrate with the freedom. Barclay said, raising his hand as if he were taking an oath. Ditto. Sparks skewered Chase with a glare before turning his suspicion on Mick Ray. How do I know we can trust you? Mick Ray considered Sparks for several moments before answering. You can't. However, you can believe that I play to win, and I plan to win this game. Kara turned away from Chase in the comm station and stared at Mick Ray. Game. How is the killing of millions a game? She was concerned, but also very curious. Mick Ray's gaze remained on Devon as he answered her. Three players. Myself, Kota, and another called Zadok. You are the set pieces. Brahma belongs to Zadok. Nimbus, Kota Olive. New Eden? He spread his arms wide. And the Starship Freedom are my pieces. The winner gets to rule Ishtar. The loser, along with one set pieces. Mikray snapped his fingers, a chilling gesture in itself. Gone. So I have a vested interest in you winning. Mikray turned back to his work, leaving them to grapple with his cryptic words. But one thing was clear. Their fate, their very existence, was now tied to his. Worry not, Captain, Mick Ray said, hands typing away at his hollow station. You still retain command of the freedom? It is forbidden for me to interfere directly. Kara couldn't stop herself from asking. Isn't that what you're doing now? Coda likes to cheat. So do I. Mick Ray winked at her. Makes the game more exciting. Now be a dear and go get your battle suit. Take Broccoli with you. Your computer made one for each of you. Why do we need battle suits? Asked Barclay. Mick Ray shook his head as if he were dealing with children. Kota has his vessel tagged now. Once we arrive in the Shahar system, we'll no doubt have guests. Chapter 16 Three planets. Not impressive for a solar system, yet against the odds Shahar had managed to wind up in the Goldilocks zone which in itself made the planet remarkable. Despite thousands of years of space travel, finding habitable worlds remained elusive. Enforcer Chen. Lasky said from the comm station. Shahar has sent five fighter squadrons on an intercept course. They're hailing us. Chen's lips curved into a predatory smile. Connect to the local government. Audio and visual on me. No need to show the enemy the Pegasus's bridge just a glimpse of his resolve, embodied in his black steel eyes and command station. According to his cursory research, Chancellor Kotal governed this new Eden colony, a flicker of light followed by a holographic shimmer resolved into Chancellor Kodel. A woman. Chen hid his surprise with practiced ease. Weak people, these new Edeners. But Kotal's dark eyes sharp as obsidian suggested strength and intelligence. Not that it mattered. Shahar would bend to his will regardless. The new Eden Navy is on its way, Kodal said. I suggest that you take your ships and depart before they are destroyed. No pleasantries, no inquiries. This woman understood the power dynamics at play. Lasky's voice chimed in. Shahar squadron still approaching. Chen maintained eye contact with Kodal's hologram, serving up his most charming fake smile. I am Guardian Chen. To whom do I have the honor of addressing? Chancellor Kodal. The woman's gaze remained unwavering, a storm brewing behind her dark eyes. Here's the situation, Chancellor. Chen began, his voice smooth like polished stone. Our month, as you know, has been obliterated. Arcadia has joined it in death. New Eden didn't destroy Arcadia, Kodal said too quickly. I am aware. It was aliens known as the Nimbus. Lasky, send a data packet to Chancellor Kodel with the information we've gathered on our true enemy. Kodel's dark eyes turned even colder as if that were possible. 
Surely you're not trying to convince me that you are not the enemy. Kodal said, her voice suddenly sweet. Especially with an armada at your back. Chen's smile faded. Politics a tedious nuisance. I'm not trying to convince you of anything, Chancellor. I have reliable information that the Nimbus will arrive in your system soon. I plan to destroy them. I doubt that, Guardian Chen. And why is that? I doubt you'll be able to even destroy the new Eden Navy. Guardian Chen, said Lasky. The Ark Gate has been activated. Multiple ships detected. Chen waved Cadell's hologram away and addressed his enforcers. Battle stations. It's good to have you back, Locke. It's good to be back, Captain Sparks, and equally good to have a crew of more than two people. Devon shook his head, grinning despite himself. The Shamash QI had passive aggressive down to a science. Still, despite all of his misgivings about Locke, his distrust, he meant it. He was happy to have the QI back and glad to have the freedom back to normal. Well, 72% power normal. Devons allowed his eyes to roam the bridge, quite the view from his captain's chair, which sat squarely on the bridge's second level. He swiped the blinking green icons on his console. Good. Barclay and Hale should be coming out of the sarcophagi in the next few minutes. Integration with the ship would be complete. He wasn't happy having Hale join the Freedom's crew. The man was a spy, a fact that didn't surprise Devon. There. One little mental command, and he now had a digital tracker on the new Eden spy. If Hale tried anything stupid, like trying to steal his ship, he would regret it. Devon's gaze shifted to Tom McRae, still working below at his hollow station. Was the hacker still alive? According to Thane, the Ishtar alien now walking around in McRae's body, McRae was on the verge of death when Thane found him, crushed underneath debris courtesy of the Nimbus's attack on Arcadia. Locke confirmed that McRae has multiple fractures that had been recently healed. What's Thane's endgame? No way he can trust him. Exiting FTL in two minutes. Mick Ray's announcement was devoid of any human warmth. Tom Mick Ray, the Joker that he had come to know, was gone, replaced by an alien with weird glowing eyes, an alien with godlike abilities. Acknowledged, Kara said over the bridge's speakers from the engineering section. Understood, Kara. Devon felt the pressure on his arms first. His chair was molding to his body protection against their exit from slip space. Devon glanced at Mick Ray. Apparently, the Ishtar don't need impact absorption chairs. The freedom shuddered as it ripped out of slip space, definitely not up to full strength. Normal space insertion complete, Locke said. Devon gasped. The holomist showed a wall of carnage and death. Battleships, once bastions of steel, hung open like gutted beasts, their innards spilling molten fire and the fight was still going on. Razor-sharp lasers sliced through hulls, leaving behind glowing scars that pulsed like dying stars, fighter ships vaporizing each other, debris littered space, probably both New Eden and Brahma casualties. Looks like we're late to the party, Devon muttered, his eyes still scanning the battle. Shahar still stands, Mick Ray said, as do both opposing fleets. Devon unclenched his jaw. Time was running out. Locke, patch me through to whoever's leading these two forces. Now. Done, Captain. Holographic projections of Colonel Klein and Enforcer Chen materialized, floating mere meters away from Devon. The Colonel, a stern woman with icy brown eyes, scanned what she could of Devon's environment before glaring at him. Enforcer Chen simply smirked but no question that he too was taking in as much of the Freedom's Bridge as he could. Klein spoke first. Sparks. We meet again, smuggler, added Chen. Devon wasn't expecting banter from the Enforcer, but he didn't have time for it. None of them did. We don't have much time, Devon said, so I'll get straight to the point. You both need to stand down, right now. A grinning Chen pointed to Klein. She started it. What was wrong with this guy? Locke, did you send the Cygnus data packet to Klein? Yes, Captain. Klein's scowl deepened as she read something off screen. What is this? 
Most likely the same thing that I sent you before you started shooting. Devin knew from experience that Klein was trigger happy. Klein looked back up. This information is unverified. Stay out of this, Sparks. When I'm done with this Brahma nonsense, I'm coming after you next. Her image winked out. Chen shook his head, but he didn't look particularly angry. This didn't make any sense. It sounded like he didn't want to fight New Eden. Stubborn woman. Why are you here, Chen, if not to attack Shahar? Chen wagged a finger at him. Guardian Chen. And I'm here to fight the Nimbus, naturally. Condescending jerk. Devin hated the guy ever since he blew up the Blue Jay. Plus, he tried to kill Mendez and him on Centauri Station, and now he's claiming to be some kind of guardian. Possible, especially with that armada behind him, but at least he was on their side. For now. Give me a minute. Locke? Yes, Captain? Devin looked down at McRae, who was staring back at him. Execute Operation Dragon Slayer. Chapter 17 Kota Aleph's reptilian eyes narrowed, a hint of unease disrupting his usual serenity. The Brahma New Eden War, orchestrated with such meticulous planning, felt too effortless. From the sacred Friedal Temple, Kota watched the battle play out. Such brutal destruction and explosive vengeance, and death, lighting up what the humans call Shahar Space. Warped metal and frozen carcasses floated in and out of the image that his seer sphere was providing. No sounds naturally, not in space, but he could imagine the screams. All was as it should be. Zadok and Thane's human pawns were too busy metting out death to one another to worry about the real threat. The Nimbus. Waiting in the shadows before swooping in to vanquish the winner of this conflict. Strictly forbidden, of course, once the game is in play. Directly intervening in one's champion's fate. Like modifying the Nimbus bodies so they could phase through metal and stone and accidentally on purpose leading them to the now-dead race that made their portal technology a reality. This was all too easy. Thane, if not Zedek, should not be so readily led. What if the two miscreants join forces, strictly against the rules, of course, once the game is in play? However, it would be foolish to believe that he was the only one who cheated. Lost in thought, Coda tapped his razor-sharp claws against the smooth obsidian that made up his perch, the rhythmic click echoing throughout the stone chamber. His glorious dragon serpent form, once a symbol of his power, now felt stifling. He considered a shift, a metamorphosis that would better suit the coming storm. But impatience gnawed at him. He wouldn't shed his skin until he claimed his prize. Gazing back at the floating seer sphere, Coda continued watching the humans slicing into one another. He had scrupulously planned for a drawn-out conflict, one that would weaken both sides for a glorious Nimbus takeover. The swiftness of their self-destruction was, in a way, convenient, but still felt wrong. Well, as long as they're fighting now, the Nimbus can destroy the remaining human worlds later. A triumphant smile contorted Coda's reptilian snout, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. He had foreseen this moment for millennia, his reign cemented in blood and laser fire. But a sliver of doubt, a serpent whispering in his ear, wormed its way into his mind. Operation Dragon Slayer. How the New Eden people love their slogans and comical nomenclatures. Chen rolled his shoulders back three times to help ease the tension building up in his body. He swept his gaze across the bridge. His enforcers, garbed like him in black save the white collar, stood at their stations efficient and alert. No damage to the Pegasus unsurprising since they had not engaged with the New Eden Navy. There were better and faster ships in his new armada than the Pegasus, but a new ship with an untested crew might prove less than optimal. Chen perused the damage reports at his command station. The Naiads, a sleek carrier he had once admired, had taken heavy damage, its hull peppered with scorch marks and plasma holes. Two corvettes and twelve fighters obliterated. The New Eden Navy had suffered casualties as well. Twenty-four fighters, two battlecruisers, destroyed. Colonel Klein was proving herself to be a formidable opponent. The Brotherhood had always taught him that women were not capable of leadership. Yet another lie in their treacherous web. The alien Zadok was correct. Symbosium clouds the mind. 
Here in the heat of battle, Chen felt liberated, the hunter he was always meant to be. The freedom is hailing us, Guardian Chen. Lasky, his second in command, announced. Freedom, such an odd name for a ship. Chen resisted the smile playing behind his lips. Audio only. Yes, Guardian. Chen waved his hand over a glowing amber crystal on his console. Sparks' voice, laced with a hint of amusement, filled the bridge. Chen. He ignored the jab, responding coolly. Proceed, smuggler. Touché. Sparks chuckled. Anyway, I assume you've noticed New Eden has ceased fire. Shall I send you flowers, or would you prefer to regale me with how you managed it? The Freedom has a quantum computer? Quantum computer? Chen's eyes narrowed. Ah, so that's how you managed to break through Brahma encryption and eject our fusion drives. Exactly, said Sparks. Colonel Klein wasn't exactly keen on the whole let's join forces against the Nimbus effort, so I took over her ships. Chen's grip on his command railing tightened. The damn smuggler was making it clear that he could do the same to them. Chen forced his voice to be pleasant. And you're telling me this because... We need your help. We need you to coordinate with our QI. Chen stepped back, forcing his emotions down as he saw Zadok materialize beside him. The mouthless rock alien wore his usual stoic expression. Do what the man requests, Zadok said, his voice a mere whisper in Chen's mind. Chen glanced around. No one but him reacted to Zadok's sudden presence. Only you can see and hear me, Zadok explained as if reading his thoughts. So I suggest you communicate with me strictly with your thoughts. Telepathy? Zadok nodded. Give the freedom control of your ships. All except the Pegasus. Why not this ship as well? You have the most nukes. Chapter 18 The Sanctum Stone Wall exploded. Koda Aleph whipped his tail back around and sent another temple wall crashing. The fighting had stopped, almost as if someone flipped a switch causing the humans to cease all hostilities in Shahar space. Koda roared his rage at the heavens above, a sound that shook the very foundation of the ancient Ishtar temple. The humans had dared cease their pathetic squabble before the Nimbus could claim his prize. Koda lashed out again his serpentine tail, sending another wall crumbling in a cascade of broken stone. Thane and Zadok, those meddling devils, had clearly joined forces, disrupting his meticulously crafted machinations. Very well. Let the upstarts try stealing this war from him. He still had one more card to play. Two. If you counted Shahar's star. A cruel smile stretched across his reptilian face, allowing his forked tongue greater access to whip about. Calling upon his energies, Koda spun his body like a corkscrew through the debris, creating a whirlwind of fire and brimstone. Seconds later, he materialized on the bridge of the Nimbus flagship. Morden, as grotesque as ever, bowed low, his soldiers scrambling to follow suit. How they managed to do so with four legs, he did not know or care. Dread Lord, Morden rasped, his voice dripping with false reverence. Koda ignored the groveling, his gaze sweeping across the Nimbus expansive bridge. The sight of the patchwork of salvaged technology held together by sheer brutality did little to soothe his anger. Still, they were useful spear carriers in this crucial final act. Rise, Coda commanded, his voice a guttural hiss. The human insects have halted their war. Surprise crossed Morden's beastly face quickly replaced by a predatory glint in his wood-brown eyes. Then let us unleash our righteous fury upon them, dread lord. Let their blood stain the stars. Coda studied the creature, his amusement tinged with disgust, so eager to spill blood, yet completely oblivious to the bigger picture. He waved a clawed hand, and a sphere of crackling golden energy materialized, swirling with an image of the human vessel. The freedom. Behold, Coda said, the source of our frustration. Destroy them. Morden bristled, his voice rising. But, Dread Lord, we'd Nimbus hunger for the chance to tear and eat flesh. And you shall. 
Send a boarding party. Chill all six humans aboard. But I want that ship intact. And the human armies? Coda's eyes narrowed. He grabbed a nearby Nimbus soldier with his tail, coiling the lower half of himself around the flailing soldier in seconds. One squeeze, a cascade of blood and bone splattered the bridge. Crush them. Death by alien injection or death by alien invasion. Chase couldn't really decide which was worse. He didn't really feel different. Stronger, maybe. Eyesight. Leagues better. Masochist that you are, Chase. You just had to go look in the mirror at your new alien aspect. The medbay mirror showed him a larger, more muscular version of Sparks. Or, as Jessica would say, a metal space zombie caked with crystals. His metal skin, though, was red. Sparks. Gold. Kara. Silver. Barclay was silver, too, and now that he was connected to the ship, he was able to look it up. The colors were a ranking structure courtesy of the QI's creators. Red meant bringer of death. Warrior. He could live with that. Not that he had much choice now. Chase glanced back to the oval tactical display in front of him. The purple triangles on the screen were the Brahmins. The yellow triangles. New Eden. The tech on this bridge alone could allow a man to buy a planet. A small one. And Chase was sure Wellington would give her right hand to acquire this ship. Too bad. Die stranded in interstellar space or become an alien. Again. What choice did he have? Chase glanced at Barclay, making himself at home by the bridge's navigation station. He felt pretty sure that the ambassador wasn't exactly clamoring to be integrated into the ship either. On the bridge's top tier, Spark sat in his little high chair, while the creepy alien occupying Mick Ray's body worked on his own hollow station near the hollow mist. Said his name was Thane of Ishtar. Like that was supposed to mean something. They're coming, said Mick Ray. Who's coming? asked Sparks. The bridge lights shifted from white to blood red instead of getting klaxons or a decent warning alarm. They got something that sounded like neighbors ringing the doorbell. Spatial anomaly, said the ship's QI. Deck 2, Section Gamma. An overlay of Section Gamma appeared in Chase's vision unbidden. Habit made Chase check to see that his disruptor was fully charged. The Nimbus said Mick Ray as if reciting the weather. We'll most likely send four squads. Sparks was up and out of his chair, checking the charge on his disruptor too. How the hell did the Nimbus get in here? Mick Ray pointed to the hollow mist. Chase felt his pulse quicken. Humongous silver ships with jagged edges appeared out of nowhere, easily outnumbering New Eden and Brahma forces by a factor of three. This was going to be a slaughter. Portal technology. Mick Ray watched Sparks jump down from his perch to the main deck. Care for an explanation, Captain? Or do you wish me to kill the signal and stop more from crossing over? Kill the signal. Twenty Nimbus are now on the ship, Captain Sparks. They'll probably come for the bridge and engineering. If they can find them, said Barclay. Chase agreed with the ambassador, though it was strange to see a diplomat in a battle suit. Good thing they followed Mick Ray's advice and donned their freshly made armor. Though they won in numbers, the Nimbus were at a disadvantage when it came to finding their way around the freedom. Since waking up in what Chase could only describe as a coffin, he could swear that he hears the ship around him. Worse. Locke was now in his head, or more accurately, inside his new comm implant. Quantum Deluxe version. Chase pinged Kara's implant with a thought. We've got a boarding party, Kara. Yes, I know. Five of them appear to be making their way toward the rear of the ship. I'll join you in a couple of minutes. Belay that, Hale. Why? Kara can defend herself and engineering. In the corner of his eye, Chase could see that Barkley and Mick Ray were both busy, but neither of them were missing a beat as Sparks continued. Mendez is still in the sarcophagus getting her arm put back on. Captain Mendez's arm has already been replaced. She is, however, still in the recovery cycle. Thanks for butting in, Locke. You are most welcome, Captain Sparks. As smart as the QI was supposed to be, it didn't get sarcasm. Chase didn't care. Sparks was being stupid. I'm the best fighter on this ship. Chase plucked his new sword from his back and headed toward the exit. Sparks put himself in the way. 
which is why I know that the Nimbus won't get past you to Mendez. It does make sense, Chase. Barclay added, trying to be the peacemaker. I get it, but I won't be ordered around like a child. I'm going to help Kara. Chase felt sparks morph into his aspect form. Along with being connected to the freedom, they were connected to each other. Plus, the ugly face. Dead giveaway. I'm giving you a direct order, Hale. Order this. Chase lunged at Sparks only to be snatched up into the air. Sparks, too. Enough. McRae's voice boomed, surprisingly powerful despite emanating from his short frame. His glowing green eyes burned with an intensity that held both Chase and Sparks captive in the air. Save your petty squabbles for later. The fate of humanity hangs in the balance. And, perhaps more importantly, my life. Okay, said Sparks. You made your point, Thane. Yeah, I'll protect Sparks' girlfriend. Thought she was yours. Gentlemen, warned Barclay. Chase held his hands up in surrender. Looks like I'll be busy, Kara. Good luck. I'll need more than luck. After a noticeable pause, she added, But thank you for the sentiment. Whatever was holding them afloat disappeared. Chase and Sparks dropped to the floor, landing on their feet. Fascinating, said the QI. You drew power from the bridge, transformed it into sound, and then aimed it at Captain Sparks and Chase Hale, lifting them into the air. Mick Ray frowned and returned to his hollow screen. Shouldn't you be directing the human ships against the Nimbus? Not to worry. Unlike corporal beings like yourself, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. Figuratively speaking. Chapter 19 This was a slaughter waiting to happen. Chen, freshly promoted to Guardian, stood on the bridge of the Pegasus, assessing the tableau of violence unfolding before him. Nimbus warships outnumbered both the New Eden Navy and his armada three to one. The monstrous ships had come out of nowhere, all silver, impossibly large with jagged edges. Many of the warships had claws, which made Brahmin ship hulls tear like paper. The Nimbus warships swarmed like vultures around the New Eden and Brahma fleets. It would have been a slaughter if not for Spark's quantum intellect taking control of his and New Eden's navy. Under the quantum computer's direction, their forces were carving through the enemy with surgical precision. Following the battle wasn't easy. Sparks's quantum computer orchestrated Shahar's defense flawlessly with blinding speed. The Odyssey, one of Brahma's best destroyers, came into view, its smooth hull gleaming in the reflected inferno as it held its ground against a lumbering Nimbus warship. The Odyssey's plasma cannons lanced through the enemy's armor like water. Two New Eden corvettes darting like gnats around a bull unleashed a hail of plasma fire, their synchronized attack culminating in a blinding explosion that took down another Nimbus vessel. The shockwave rocked the Pegasus in its wake. A worrying thought clawed at Chen's mind. Am I obsolete? With Spark's quantum computer guiding their weapon systems, not only were they managing to hold the Nimbus back, they were inflicting significant damage on the invading ships. Damage reports, Lasky. We've lost four battle cruisers and 31 fighters. The Cronus and the Shiva have taken some damage also. New Eden. Similar to ours, Guardian. The calculations and coordination for such brutal warfare was difficult to fathom. Then a sudden shift in the battle caught Chen's attention. A cluster of Nimbus ships, their hulls glistening like malevolent blades, broke formation and hurtled towards Shahar. The planet, hanging like a vulnerable jewel against the backdrop of space, seemed to beckon the invaders. Apparently, Sparks's quantum computer had anticipated such a move. A contingent of Brahma battlecruisers swooped in, joined by five New Eden corvettes forming an effective blockade. Fighter ships spewed from their bays, and soon lasers pelted the Nimbus warships, allowing the larger ships to finish the job with long-distance plasma bolts. Perhaps they might win yet, and if they did... What comes next? Kiro Barkley had never been so afraid in his life. When he was fourteen, he broke out in hives when he finally summoned the courage to ask Samantha Wu out on a date. A migraine plagued him for days before the Ambassador Corps' entrance exam. And, naturally, there was the difficult decision whether or not to let Locke inject him with the alien DNA of his creators. 
all paled in comparison to this, being chased by a pack of howling, bloodthirsty Nimbus warriors. Speeding down another corridor, his breath echoed harshly inside his helmet, even though he was far from out of breath. The freedom's amber walls blurred as he tore past them, his legs pounding against the carpeted floors. Barkley skidded to a halt as a hulking Nimbus warrior, its spidery legs massive, literally phased through the solid wall in front of him. Fear, primal and cold, threatened to consume him. He raised his disruptor, his hand shaking. A beam of red crashed into the monster's left side, eliciting a heart-wrenching scream almost loud enough to cause Barkley to drop his weapon. He fired again as the Nimbus lashed out, one blow connected with Barclay's shoulder, sending him sprawling. You must kill the Nimbus warrior, Ambassador. Locke's voice inside his head. Not merely disable it, kill it. Now. Barclay scrambled to his feet, the alien DNA coursing through his veins, lending him an unnatural agility. He fired again. This time, his shot rang true the disruptor beam punching a neat hole through the base of the creature's neck. Relief washed over Barclay, then laser blasts slammed into him. Thank the heavens for this battle suit. It might make me look like a bug, but it just saved my life. Barclay spun around to see the newest threat. This Nimbus warrior was even larger than the last one. It grinned at him as it put its laser blaster back into its holster. With a sickening swoosh, it withdrew a serrated sword that crackled with an unnatural blue light. Barclay's mind reeled. Why a sword? In this age of advanced weaponry, the glowing blade seemed barbaric, almost comical. But the amusement died in his throat as the warrior swung the weapon back and forth, the air sizzling in its wake. Laser sword, Locke said. Do you know what I'm thinking? You were thinking aloud, Ambassador. The warrior rushed Barclay, its four legs making it uncannily fast. Barclay whirled back around to the shut door. Open the door, Locke, now. No need, Locke said, disturbingly calm. But Barclay didn't have time to argue. He squeezed his eyes shut, bracing for the inevitable impact. A deafening crack echoed through the corridor, followed by the sickening thud of a heavy object hitting the floor behind him. Barclay opened his eyes, his heart hammering against his ribs as he turned back around. The Nimbus warrior lay sprawled before him, a smoking crater inside its chest. Beside it, a section of the corridor wall was glowing, revealing a swirling vortex of energy. The door opened, startling Barclay, reminding him why he became an ambassador instead of a soldier. Still in shock, Barclay stumbled through, wrestling with the fear clinging to his insides. The door clanged shut. There are three Nimbus left, Locke said. In the whole ship. Seeking you, as we had hoped. S Stupid, agreeing to be used as bait. But again, what choice did he have? Kara needed to defend engineering. Chase had to protect Kara. Sparks and the alien calling himself Thane needed to defend the bridge. He was expendable, and he did volunteer so he would do his best. Barclay sprinted down yet another corridor. Why did the freedom have to be so damn big? He skidded to a halt before a gleaming silver travel capsule. It was his ticket out of this nightmare, a chance to regroup and strategize. He reached out, fingers trembling as they brushed against the capsule's cool metal. Ambassador, Locke's voice echoed in his head. Continue drawing the remaining Nimbus away from engineering. We cannot risk them joining their sister squad. Barclay hesitated, his gaze flitting between the inviting capsule and the endless corridor stretching before him. But wouldn't it be more efficient to... Do not fear, Ambassador. We are better fighters than the Nimbus. Barclay frowned. Did the QI mean that he and Locke together made better fighters, which would be hard to believe? Or if the quantum intelligence was using the royal we? The sensors in his HUD blinked red. Barclay looked around in confusion. He didn't see anyone. Until... There, by the east wall, a Nimbus monster phased through the wall. It smiled at Barclay, then bared its teeth as it slashed its laser sword through the air. Do not panic, Ambassador. We've got him right where we want him. Again with the Wii? The monster moved too fast. 
Even with Barclay's increased agility, the thing was on top of him in seconds. It clawed at him and pounded him. In the faceplate, the stomach. Only his silver battlesuit was protecting him, but that didn't stop the pain coming from the blows, even in his alien aspect. Like being hit by a tree trunk. Repeatedly. Barclay found himself pinned under the creature. He started to panic when he realized the Nimbus warrior was trying to pierce his armor with its sharp, spidery legs. Grab your combat knife. What? Please follow instructions, Ambassador. An overlay materialized in his HUD, showing a stick-like figure performing the requested action. Thrust upwards with full force. Barclay fumbled for the knife hilt at his hip, adrenaline coursing through his veins. The warrior's fist descended, but with a surge of unexpected strength, Barclay jammed his knife upwards. The blade cut through the creature's underside, rewarding Barclay with a spray of green liquid. The warrior screeched before going limp and falling on top of him. It took some effort to get from out underneath the disgusting thing. Barclay got back to his feet, wanting desperately for this to be over, but he didn't need Locke to tell him. There were two more Nimbus warriors left. He wasn't surprised in the least as they phased through the wall, their spidery forms blocking his escape. Barclay tried not to panic. He had killed three already. What's another two? The Nimbus warrior's wooden brown eyes held a predatory glint. The guttural growl rumbling in their throats was chilling. Barclay raised his disruptor, his hand trembling slightly. He had never taken a life before today. Howling, they lunged as one. Barclay fired and missed several times. The monsters stopped mere meters away from him, their bodies contorting and spasming, their legs collapsing like deflated balloons as if incapable of carrying their own weight. Barclay watched in horror as the Nimbus warriors crumpled to the floor, twitching and groaning. Ambassador. This time Locke's voice came from outside of his mind. I hate to ask you to do this, but I need you to set aside your sense of fair play and terminate the Nimbus this instant. That's quite all right, Locke. Barclay aimed his disruptor and pulled the trigger. Sometimes the best diplomacy starts at the end of a gun's barrel. Chapter 20 Commandeer or Destroy That's what she would do if she were storming an enemy ship's engineering section. Kara crouched behind a deactivated plasma conduit, both her sword and disruptor drawn. They're coming, Kara, Locke said into her implant. Aft section west. Through the gaps in the Freedom's machinery, Kara glimpsed a chilling sight. Five hulking Nimbus warriors started to appear, their grotesque forms shimmering as they phased through the solid bulkhead opposite her. Locke had warned her about the invader's ability to literally phase through walls and doors. It still took a few seconds to process what her eyes were seeing, before she pulled back to where she wouldn't be spotted. Kara knew what she had to do, but a nagging doubt troubled her. She was an administrator, not a soldier. Yet the safety of the freedom and everyone on board rested on her shoulders, perhaps even the survival of mankind. I'm no fighter, Locke. She transmitted mentally. You are the freedom's engineer, Locke countered, which makes you far greater than mere nimbus warriors. They rely on brute strength but you possess ingenuity and knowledge. They are the storm, Kara, but you are the anchor. She didn't feel like an anchor, more like chaff caught in a violent storm. She was glad that she was having this conversation in her head where no one could hear her lack of resolve. I'll strike first, Kara, Locke continued. Then you kill as many as you can with your sword. How am I going to get close enough? Trust me. She did trust him and hoped it wouldn't be her undoing. A high-pitched screech assaulted her ears but cut off just as suddenly. Her HUD indicated that her sound had been muted. The five Nimbus warriors weren't as fortunate as they desperately clasped their hands over their ears. Attack now, Kara. She took a deep breath and burst out of the shadows. Faster than humanly possible, she was on the invaders and stabbing the nearest one. His scream didn't surprise her, but the swiftness in which he ripped the sword out of his side did. Her sword was now his. He slashed at her hard and fast, which should have removed her head. Somehow she ducked the blow with seconds to spare, not fast enough to escape the second Nimbus's grasp. 
With barely a grunt, he tossed Kara halfway across the room. She crashed into a bank of consoles, eliciting sparks and smoke as she rolled to the floor. Kara shook her head to clear her mind. Her battle suit took most of the blow, but still she ached all over. Her HUD showed a Nimbus warrior clamoring over toward her, while the others started blasting everything in sight. Do you trust me, Kara? She wondered why Locke was asking again. Yes. Tears streamed from her eyes as she screamed herself raw. Electric knives ripped through her body, leaving her breathless, then energized. Kara clambered to her feet, no longer feeling in control of her own body, then sprinted toward the approaching Nimbus. Laser blasts ricocheted off her armor as she leapt into the air, spinning like a top, then crashing into the two attacking Nimbus warriors. Faster than she could think, she fired her disruptor at the fallen Nimbus warriors, leaving their bodies headless. Howls from behind warned Kara of two more Nimbus. One was firing his laser at her while the other slashed at her with a huge serrated laser sword. Kara spun around to face them in one fluid motion, firing her disruptor at the farthest Nimbus and blowing his head off in a splash of gore and green blood. His companion sucker punched her, knocking her down. Kara almost lost her grip on the disruptor. She gasped as the Nimbus held her down with two of his spidery legs. He raised his sword for the killing blow and cried out as he collapsed onto his side. She had apparently shot off one of his back legs. Kara rolled out of the way before it could fall on her and aimed for his head. Die. Exactly. She shot it in the face. Not easy when on your back. An ear-piercing howl brought her back to the precariousness of her situation. The remaining Nimbus was pointing his blaster at her. This was it. She was going to die. The Nimbus howled a second time as it crumpled to the floor. Barkley, disruptor barrel still smoking, stood behind the mangled flesh. I'm sorry that I'm late. She could have kissed him, which was, of course, a ridiculous notion. She really needed to get a hold of her emotions. Are you all right, Kara? Barkley asked. Kara didn't answer him. She felt cold, and not simply because of the smoldering ruins of what used to be the Nimbus. She pinged the QI and said, You promised, Locke. You promised not to make me a drone. I took over your battlesuit, Kara, not your body. You know what I mean. The continued existence of your race depends upon the freedom. I could not allow the Nimbus to kill you. In the not-too-distant future, you will learn how to operate your battlesuit at peak efficiency. Is this your version of an apology? The pause was notable. Yes, please forgive me. What Locke did was logical. She respected that. Still, it hurt. I'll take care of things in engineering, Ambassador. Please assist Captain Sparks. He's under attack. Chapter 21 Many of the crazy things that Locke could do bordered on magic, but phasing through walls, this was on another level of mind-blowing. Despite Locke's warning, Devon stared with his mouth open as three giant nimbus phased through the bridge's door, solidifying almost immediately into ape-like spiders with blasters and swords. Switch to stealth, Captain Sparks. How do I do that? Devon didn't have a clue. All of a sudden he couldn't see his own hand or body just a hazy distortion of the bridge. He didn't even know that his battlesuit had a stealth function. Luckily, Locke could activate it for him. He felt his hand reach for the knife at his waist. He was throwing the knife. It hit the middle nimbus dead on in the center of its forehead. The creature collapsed in a heap of gross spider legs. Its buddies didn't waste any time mourning, attempting to flank Devon. Things moved fast too. But in this suit and alien aspect, he was faster. Devon whipped his belt off and was surprised how far it extended, encircling one nimbus neck. Devon yanked hard, severing the creature's head from the rest of its hairy body. Kara was pissed that Locke took over her battlesuit. Devon welcomed it. With Locke in charge, he was five times as deadly. One nuisance to go. But that still left the other two nimbus who hadn't shown up yet. Two more incoming said Thane, who was still occupying Mikray's body. The alien had been annoyingly vague about whether Mikray was still alive or not. He was sitting above the fray in the captain's chair, just watching. 
A pair of Nimbus phased through the bridge door, swords raised. They must want to take the bridge intact, so no laser blasters. Three against one, ready, Locke? The QI responded via his quantum implant. Absolutely. Now sit back and watch. Devon found himself taking off with unbelievable speed as he headed straight for the gruesome threesome. Hell, he was actually running on the wall like gravity had shifted. The Nimbus adapted quickly but not fast enough. He fired two successive shots, striking two of the Nimbus in the neck. Devon hit the floor running, ducking underneath the last Nimbus's deadly swing. Its blade's edge missed his head by a hair's breadth. Without missing a beat, Devon aimed his disruptor upward and fired. The Nimbus's head exploded. Well done, Captain Sparks. Thane looked down at him with huge glowing green eyes. But it was the thing standing next to the alien that made Devon's anxiety spike. It was like looking at an erupting volcano. But this volcano had eyes and could talk. Without a mouth. You're about to have another guest, human. Besides you, Devon managed. The impossibly tall thing nodded. He is the most powerful Ishtar. Koda Aleph. Chase slammed face first into the wall and saw stars as he slid to the floor. If it weren't for this battle suit, he'd be dead right now. The irony that he was getting his butt kicked in the med bay didn't escape him. Care for some assistance, Chase Hale? No. Chase barked. Through his alien voodoo connection with Kara and Sparks, he knew that the Freedom's QI had taken over their battle suits to beat back the Nimbus. Made sense. But he was a trained agent. One of New Eden's best. He didn't need some stupid quantum computer fighting his battles. A Nimbus warrior plucked Chase from the floor and sent him flying over a med bay bed meters away. He crashed hard, landing on his back. Through his momentary haze, Chase heard the QI's voice again. May I suggest using your belt? No, you may not. According to his suit specs, the belt acted like a lasso of sorts. Ignoring his hypocrisy, Chase snatched the belt from his waist and hurled the front end at the snarling Nimbus to his left, encircling its tree trunk of an arm. He pulled hard with both hands, severing the Nimbus's arm at the shoulder. The thing shrieked in protest. That's for Jessica. Even though he was aiming for the alien's neck, a laser blast pelted his chest. Its heat took his breath away, but the battle suit held. It would take a lot more than a couple of laser blasts to get past the graphite and titanium of this fancy armor. The QI said that it had reinforced the battle suits with polyethylene after Jessica lost an arm to these guys. Wearing untested armor into battle was dicey at best, but this battle suit practically moved like a second skin, even if he did look like a bug smothered into a wetsuit. For some reason, the five Nimbus soldiers weren't coordinating with one another against him. If they did, he would be dinner already. Each Nimbus seemed to be consumed by its own bloodlust, which was fine by him. That didn't mean they didn't know how to use a blaster. A barrage of laser blasts had Chase dodging and running. Lots of expensive-looking medical equipment got smoked, but as long as it wasn't him, he could live with it. Ole alien Micray was right. He was seeing plenty of action in the med bay. Chase just managed to retrieve his sword seconds before a serrated sword came thrashing down on him. He blocked the first strike, but the Nimbus's buddy took advantage of his distraction. A sword almost as big as his thighs sparked as it connected with Chase's gut, sending him sprawling onto his back. No internal bleeding according to his HUD, but his entire midsection felt numb. Forcing the discomfort from his mind, Chase leapt onto one of the Nimbus' back, Diving off moments before another Nimbus drove half his sword into its buddy's back, the creature cried out as it shuddered. Chase wasn't surprised when said buddy withdrew its sword and flung its fellow Nimbus to the side. One down, four more to kill. All four of Nimbus soldiers fired at him. Chase dove to the floor, snatched up his sword as he slid toward the group, knees first. He swung his sword like a bat at their legs. Three of them dodged, the one center left, its two front legs came off with a loud thwack. Chase sprung to his feet, ready to stab some more, but one Nimbus managed to flank him on the right. It raked its claw against Chase's breastplate, eliciting sparks. Chase kneed the thing in the gut, then blasted it in the chest. It looked down at the hole in its chest, then glared back at Chase before backhanding him. Chase found himself on the floor yet again, which would be embarrassing if he weren't in so much pain. A glowing battle axe almost took his damn head off.
His zombie alien form made him faster, and the battle suit just multiplied his speed. The nimbus with the giant battle axe swung hard, causing several pieces of metal flooring to shatter where it struck. Ducking a sword jab coming fast from the right, Chase shot Mr. Battleaxe in the chest. Target the neck or the head. Shut up, he told the QI, then fired a disruptor beam into Mr. Battleaxe's neck, searing off enough to make the rest of the head topple over. Chase ran past the dying Nimbus. A second Battleaxe knocked him right back. This time he wound up lying on his stomach. Hearing spidery thumps coming his way, Chase rolled hard to the left. The axe smashed down breaths from his head. Even with his reinforced helmet, Chase doubted that he could withstand a blow from one of those battle axes. He jabbed his sword forward to distract the Nimbus, then blasted it in the face with his disruptor. Clawing at its ruined face, the Nimbus dropped its sword as it sunk to the floor. Two to go. Too bad a Nimbus was pulling him from the floor, it literally threw him like a baseball. Pain sprouted in every part of his body when he went splat against Jessica's sarcophagus. So much for protecting her. But now he was super pissed. Pissed that he was getting his face wiped by a bunch of spider aliens. Pissed that he had to become a space zombie to escape interstellar space. Chase heard rather than saw Jessica's sarcophagus open. Before he could close it, one of the surviving Nimbus soldiers grabbed him by the throat and held him high in the air. Time to die, human. Exactly. Chase tilted his wrist up and shot it in the gut. The Nimbus smiled, showing alarmingly white shark teeth, then returned the favor by slapping him. Damn, more stars. A disruptor blast sailed over his shoulder and into Hello Shark Teeth's face. It didn't have time to scream, but its buddy did. Jessica fired again, and missed. The Nimbus warrior was that fast. How Jessica retrieved his disruptor so quickly was something to be considered later. If there was a later. The last Nimbus howled as it rushed toward them. Jessica fired. Chase flicked his dagger, which connected with its throat seconds before Jessica's shot splattered its head. They stood in silence for a few moments. Chase accessed Jessica's vitals, 40% below optimal. She came out of the sarcophagus too soon. She should be fine, though. He connected with the Freedom Security Systems. All Nimbus squads were eliminated. I'm not even out of breath. Jessica stared at her new arm before turning back to Chase. I'm a space zombie now, aren't I? He nodded and put an arm around her shoulder. No point in lying. We both are, darling. Somehow he was surprised when she hid her face in his chest and wept. Damn aliens. Chapter 22 Spatial anomaly detected. Location computer. It was clear to Devon now. Thane had seized full control. Micray was gone, his consciousness pushed aside, possibly for good. Tracking. Devon's skin started tingling, and suddenly, right there in front of him, taking up a good third of the bridge, a dragon. A goddamn dragon, with the body of a serpent. Its scales were jet black, but reflected color like a prism. It roared, so Devon shot it, twice with his disruptor. With a flick of its tail, the nightmare sent Devon crashing into the tactical station. Head throbbing, Devon waited for his vision to clear. His hearing, too, because apparently he was hearing things. It sounded like the dragon was talking. You dare break the law and team up against me? Thane looked down from the bridge's top tier, his glowing green eyes unreadable. You cheated first, Coda. Directly given your soon-to-be-dead Nimbus technology, they had no right to. Very well, usurper. Better to end you now. Moving impossibly fast for such a big monster, the dragon unfurled its neck, opened its alligator-shaped snout, and let loose with a torrent of golden-blue light, totally engulfing Thane and his alien friend Zadok. When computers break, that's where humans come in, I suppose. Chen kept his thoughts to himself, knowing his enforcers wouldn't understand such philosophical musings. Obedience, not introspection, was the Brahma Corps directive, an effective strategy to run an empire. Most of the time, but Chen saw the limitations. He, like the traitor Kara, was a different breed. The council, for all their strategizing and mandates, were stuck in their rigid ways. Power, not progress, fueled their decisions. 
That was likely why the alien Zadok had chosen him, his sharp mind and sheer drive to win at all costs. Ironic that he was now essentially taking orders from the freedom when he spent so many weeks trying to capture it. But abstract contemplation wouldn't win this war. Neither apparently would a single so-called quantum computer. A part of Chen felt thrilled by the thought of taking humanity's fate into his own hands. The more cynical part of him said they were delaying the inevitable. Their forces were doing so well up until a few minutes ago. Now they were losing ground. Is the freedom still controlling our forces? It appears so, Guardian Chen, however... Lasky trailed off, his eyes uncertain. Out with it. The data streams from the freedom seem to be slowing down. Chen set his water thermos down on his command console to confirm Lasky's readings. Readings confirmed. Interesting. Two squads of Nimbus warships were bearing down on the freedom, their energy beams sizzling lights of death. The supercomputer was quick to use a pair of new Eden destroyers and three Brahmin frigates to defend itself, but it was a paltry force against the oncoming onslaught. Apparently even Sparks' supercomputer has its limits. Chen watched the battle with renewed interest, glad to be more than a spectator in this clash of titans. The Nimbus still outnumbered their temporary alliance, and without the freedom orchestrating the battle properly, their chances of survival let alone winning had dropped from poor to virtually non-existent. A deafening clang resonated through the bridge as the Pegasus lurched violently. Red warning lights strobed across the bridge. Screaming bells came next. Report! Enemy assault impacting decks three and four. Lasky's voice, though urgent, was anything but panicked. That's what made enforcers superior fighters. Calm until death. Barkley, watch out. Devon's warning came too late. Electric white light shot out of the dragon's mouth and smashed into Barkley, splattering him against the comm station. Fascinating. Our adversary has the ability to manipulate quantum energies. Don't care right now, Locke. Just tell me how to use this stupid sword. Better than that. I'll show you how. Devon jumped up eight meters and landed on the dragon serpent's winding body. His titanium blade raked across its scaly hide. The dragon roared, spinning its neck to face Devon. It opened its mouth, probably to hit him with one of those quantum blasts. Thane struck the beast with a crackling beam of energy that came from the palm of his hand, enraging the beast further. But the dragon was fast. It snatched up Thane and threw him at Barkley, who was just about to shoot it. Both Barkley and Thane went down in a heap. Devon's HUD told him that Barkley was okay, just stunned and aching all over, just like him. Yeah, this battlesuit was something else, but he would have lots of bruises once this was over, or he would be dead. Devon felt his arms lifting his sword over his head for another strike. He wondered if Locke was controlling his armor, or him. Before he could land the blow, Devon felt himself flying off the dragon serpent into the air, where he got a good view of his damaged bridge. That's when he realized Thane and Barkley were floating too. Thane's eyes were glowing green again. A double cross. Devon whipped out his disruptor and aimed it at Thane, but hesitated. He would be killing Mick Ray too. Thane's alien pal, Zadok jumped down from the top tier, striking a rocky fist on the floor as he landed. Explosions of gold light accompanied by a thunderous boom followed. The dragon serpent shrieked. Purple splotches of what Devon assumed was blood streaked across the black dragon's scaly hide. Its body curled around so fast Devon barely had time to see the dragon open its alligator mouth and chomp down on half of Zadok's body. So gross. Devon also felt bad for the dead alien. How are we going to beat this guy, Locke? It was Thane who answered. You've lost, Coda. Don't you feel it? The dragon serpent did a 360 with its neck and glared at Thane. I sense truth in your words, fiend. What paltry threat do you offer me besides these fools? Its red eyes seemed to glaze over for several moments. No. This was way too weird, and frightening if he were honest with himself. What's happening, Locke? This is pure speculation on my part, Locke said into Devon's quantum implant. Perhaps the dragon has expanded its awareness and realizes that New Eden and Brahma have cut down over three quarters of the Nimbus warships, under my renewed direction, of course. Of course, 
Caught off guard, Devon watched transfixed as the gargantuan dragon serpent turned its flaming eyes on him. Its monstrous form, a chimera of serpent and dragon dripped with purple blood and goo. You have destroyed the dreams of a god. The creature boomed, its words laced with a cold fury. You're no god, Devon said, his voice ringing clear despite the trembling of the ship. The dragon's head snapped closer, its huge mouth open, showing off its huge, sharp teeth. Compared to your kind, I am. Does this mean you wish to surrender? Asked Barclay. The dragon paused, its gaze sweeping across the bridge, then lowered its head to glance at the gaping holes and purple blood spilling from its monstrous body. I wish to have you join me in death. It rasped, unleashing a wave of energy that knocked Devon and Barkley off their feet. A blinding flash of white-hot light followed, and the dragon was gone. Nothing left but a badly bruised bridge littered with the mangled remains of dead Nimbus soldiers. The red warning lights were still on, but at least they were still alive. Barclay retracted his helmet. Oh my goodness, we've won. Not yet, said Thane. He sported a black eye, and at a glance it looked like his right arm was broken. The alien currently residing in Thomas McRae's body is correct, Ambassador. The hollow mist reappeared in the center of the bridge. In it, Devon could clearly see a silvery Nimbus dreadnought. The alien dragon is now on the Nimbus flagship, Locke said, which has changed its course toward Shaha's sun. That's suicide. No, Captain Sparks, Thane said. That's genocide. A massacre gone wrong. In a matter of minutes, the battle had transformed from the aliens pulverizing their forces to Brahma and New Eden, slicing through Nimbus warships with brutal fury. Obviously, the Freedom supercomputer was now fully back in control. Chen watched with calculating interest as the New Eden Navy and Brahma's desperate scramble for survival quietly morphed into an aggressive strategy. An impressive New Eden battle carrier caught Chen's eye. Along with hammering a particularly large Nimbus warship with its manned fighters, the carrier hit the Nimbus ship with wave after wave of plasma bolts until they finally pierced the hull. Seconds later, the ship erupted into a spectacular ball of fire. Then something odd happened. The Nimbus dreadnought, the ship most likely giving the orders since it was the most protected, suddenly started retreating toward the sun. The freedom is hailing us, Lasky announced. Chen considered for a moment. Audio and visual if you have it. A high-res holographic projection materialized in front of Chen's command station, revealing a man dressed in black armor that seemed to be forged from the night sky itself. Its sleek obsidian contours were traced with lines of radiant gold, creating an intricate web across the suet surface that seemed to shimmer with a life of its own. If he didn't have his helmet off, Chen might not have recognized him. What is it, Sparks? The Nimbus flagship is headed toward the sun. Chen waved his hand dismissively for the smuggler to get on with it. We think they're going to blow it up. You mean your computer thinks Nimbus plans to blow up the star? Sparks' eyes narrowed for a moment, then he nodded. And how exactly would they blow up a star? Even a hundred nuclear weapons wouldn't do the job. Antimatter. Chen was no scientist, but antimatter. Well, that could turn any life giving star into a supernova. Shahar would be destroyed. A new Eden colony, so it wouldn't bother him. Unfortunately, it would also take him and his armada out as well. What do you expect me to do? Blow them up with your nukes. You're the closest ship with nuclear armament. Chen shook his head at the absurd idea. The Nimbus would blow my missiles to dust before they got close enough. We'll help you get close. You won't have to fire. Just detonate. Just detonate. The words hung in the air. Chen scanned the bridge, glaring at the enforcers staring at him. They instantly turned back to their duties. I see. It looked like he would be getting burned after all, just not at the stake. I'm sorry, Chen. So am I. I really would have enjoyed killing you. The smuggler looked sad. Perhaps in the next life. Brahmins don't believe in an afterlife. Chen cut the link and addressed his enforcers. As I'm certain you've all just heard, 
We need to take down the Nimbus Dreadnought that's headed to Shahar's son. Helm! No. Enforcer Andre swiveled his seat around to glower at Chen. You bribed your way into guardianship. I won't allow you to sacrifice our lives for New Eden filth. Brahma filth as well. Chen wanted to add, but he kept silent as he discreetly reached underneath his command console for his blaster. Turns out, there was no need. Enforcer Lasky was already aiming a blaster at Andre's flustered face. Die like a coward, brother. Or die honorably. Andre's face turned redder, a cross between anger and embarrassment. Conduct more than unbecoming for an enforcer. But was he any better? I yield. Andre spun around in his chair and hit several buttons. Corset for Shahar's son. Normally he would kill the man and be done with it, but Andre was going to die anyway. They all were. Chen looked at Lasky and nodded. Thank you, Enforcer Lasky. A pleasure to have served under you, Guardian. Interesting. The feeling possessing him now was odd. He had felt pride before, but Lasky's actions and commitment. Better not to overthink this. Chen gave Lasky his full attention. Engage fusion drives, brother. Lasky. Fusion drives engaged, brother Chen. A slight tingle in his feet, but nothing else suggested the Pegasus's increased speed, aside from the monitors and readings. With the press of a single button, Chen activated the ship's comm. All hands, prepare for battle. We have a war to end. The Pegasus shot forward and was soon gaining on the Nimbus Dreadnought. A pack of Nimbus warships like ravenous crows soon swarmed around them. The Pegasus shuddered under the bombardment of laser blasts. Warning alarms screamed in protest, loud enough as if testing Chen's resolve. Maintain course. Chen ordered, his eyes fixed on their prey. They needed to destroy the dreadnought before it got close enough to detonate whatever antimatter they were carrying. Three New Eden Corvettes came to their aid, firing volley after volley of plasma bolts. Even with their skilled fighter ships, they were no match for so many Nimbus warships. All too soon, their hulls were ablaze as the New Eden ships drifted off course. Well, Chen muttered to himself. At least we're not the only ones being sacrificed today. They were still gaining on the Nimbus Dreadnought. A small cluster of Brahma fighters covered their attack run, but the Dreadnought's defensive weapons picked them off nearly two at a time. Lasers didn't seem to do much damage to its hull. We're almost in range, sir, Lasky said, still calm, forever an enforcer. The Dreadnought tried to shake them as Nimbus ships came to their rescue and converged on the Pegasus's position, hammering them with particle beams. Hull breach on deck three, Lasky said. Fusion core nearing critical. Give me a countdown when we're within target radius. Chen keyed in the self-destruct sequence of the four nuclear missiles the Pegasus was carrying. Thirty seconds. Chen almost smiled, but that wouldn't set a good example. Not that it mattered anymore. He had never truly believed in freedom, not in the whimsical, idealistic sense, but as he stared at the rapidly approaching dreadnought, a different kind of freedom settled within him. The freedom to choose his own end, even if it meant becoming a martyr in a war not entirely his own. One question, however, bothered him. Was this a choice he truly made, or simply the inevitable consequence of the path he had chosen? Ten seconds. Chen flipped the nuclear switch and screamed. Chapter 23 Freedom Devon stared into the bridge's hollow mist at the stars and felt a sense of wonder. He felt pretty sure that this feeling wasn't Locke's, though the quantum intelligence was a part of him now. Or perhaps he was a part of it. They were just outside of the Shahar system, ready to jump into FTL should Brahma or New Eden decide to come after them. Devon figured they would be too busy picking up the pieces. Plenty of busted-up ships on both sides, the two empires would work together. For how long? Devon didn't want to bet money on it. Standing on the bridge's lower tier with the rest of the crew, Devon reflected on the stars, Locke and his new life. He even thought about Chen and the unexpected sacrifice the Enforcer had made. Would he have made the same choice? He hoped so, but did he truly have Chen's courage? Devon's gaze fell to his crew, Kara, Barkley, Chase, and Mick Ray. He didn't relish the idea of having to put their lives at risk again. 
Then again, exploring the vast unknown of space always carried danger, especially with hostile alien forces potentially lurking. Risks. Devon's attention settled on Mick Ray seated at the comm station. The hacker, a good fifteen years younger now, seemed content, but who knew if the alien force that had possessed him was truly gone for good? Devon suppressed a shudder. The fact that aliens like Thane and Coda the Dragon could turn themselves into antimatter. Chilling. The bridge door whooshed open and in strode Mendez, confident as ever, her arm whole once more. Everyone's eyes turned towards her, but she ignored them, walking over to Devon instead. Permission to enter the bridge, Captain. For a couple of seconds, Devon just stared. Mendez was always gorgeous, but after the alien injection and the way that red sash hugged her hips, she could get a guy like him into all sorts of trouble. Permission granted, Devon finally managed to say. Captain Mendez. Mendez arched a perfect eyebrow. A ship can only have one captain, but I accept the frequency of Helm Officer. For now. She winked at him. Devon hoped he wasn't blushing. Is Jessica ready for duty, Locke? Devon felt Locke's presence nudge his mind. Jessica Mendez was born ready, Captain. Welcome back, Jessica. Barclay pulled Mendez into a brief hug and pulled away just as suddenly. Sorry, Captain Sparks. I think we all may have overheard Locke give you the okay. It's all right, Barkley. Devon shifted his focus back to Mendez. Take your station helm. Mendez turned to go, but Devon caught her by the arm, her once missing arm. She looked down meaningfully at his grip on her, then back at him. Surprisingly, there was no malice in her pretty gray eyes. He released her and tossed her his gold coin. For luck. Thank you. Mendez said, her eyes saying, you're not so bad. For a space zombie. As Mendez made her way to the helm console, Chase flashed her a devilish grin. Hey, I can give you a coin too if you want. Mendez didn't break stride. Keep it and buy yourself a personality, spy boy. Mick Ray burst out laughing, quickly swallowing it when Chase shot him a glare. Chase turned to Kara and flashed her an apologetic grin. Don't look at me, Chase. I'm having dinner with Barclay tonight. Perhaps Thomas is available. I'd rather... Mick Ray faltered under Chase's death stare. Anyway, where are we headed? I'm itching to test out my new alien mumbo-jumbo upgrades. Law cleared his throat, drawing everyone's attention. I have two suggestions, if I may, Freedom Crew. Let's hear it, Locke, Devon said, leaning against the comms console. We can take a much-deserved mini-vacation and do a little galactic sightseeing, explore uncharted sectors and the like. Or, Locke continued, we can start staffing the Freedom with a crew. Chase, all charm again, turned back to Kara. Maybe some of your fellow Brahmins would be interested. That might take some persuading. Lady's choice, Devon said, smiling. What do you think, Mendez? I think that's sexist. Smiling, Mendez gestured to Kara. Let Kara decide. Aren't I a woman, too? You're Brahmin, so... Mendez shrugged, then laughed. They all did. Devon couldn't remember the last time he laughed. It felt right, here and on the freedom, with these people in lock. It all felt... right. Star Hunter. Written by Savage Tempest. Copyright 2024. The End.